Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 18th episode of the Neon Crew Podcast. My name is Kyle. And my name is McLean. Hi, McLean. So, uh, McLean, first of all, happy birthday. Hey, thank you. Even though I sent you a text and wished you happy birthday, I'll still say it for the sake of, of the... Potting. Yeah, the, the clout, as they say. Yeah. As the kids say. Because um, I, I, I want people to hear me say to you happy birthday instead of, you know, just like a private thing. Yeah, you know, yeah, 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 yeah. Just to make instead sure of that something that's knows. more intimate and you know friendship oriented. Yeah, I, I want it to be like a public thing so people think better of me. So happy birthday! <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. How old are you? Uh thirty-two. Ooh, yeah. nice. Thirty-two. Ten. In ten years, you'll be forty-two, and that will be the same number as uh, Jackie, Jackie Robinson. Robinson. See, I did a sports Whoa! thing for you. That's my birthday present to you. I made a sports reference. There we go. <laughs> God, greatest day ever. <laughs> do you find that you, uh, do you like feel the change in age when it happens? Or do you find that you're like me where you kind of feel it a month before it actually takes place? Have you ever seen Interstellar? Yes. Yes. <laughs> that is how it goes. Rapidly aging on a planet. Yep. <laughs> no. Um, I mean, it's, I don't know. I mean, the older you get, it's kind of like one of those things. It's just, it's happening, I guess. I don't really feel the age. Maybe I should lean into it more, but. Yeah, you know, have have people carry your groceries for you, walk you down the, the street. I need my AARP membership card. Yeah, I think you got to wait 18 more years for that, right? Don't you get that when you're like 50? Or is it 55? I'm not sure. I think it's 55 because I remember when my, my parents complained about it when they got it, and that was like two years ago. Oh, yeah. yeah. No, it'll be one of the another thing that I'll probably be late to the party on. So, mm. uh, uh, Speaking of party, uh, Mario Party is a, is a video game. Is that why? He- and uh, speaking of Mario, uh, we got some, some movie news to talk about. So Yeah. Uh, <laughs> really, it's the only one that I've like kind of come across and paid attention to because uh, I've been very busy. Um, we'll get to that in a second. Oh, boy. Um, so the Mario movie that was supposed to come out this year, mm-hmm. December 21st, is now delayed until April 7th, I believe, of 2023. Shocker. Um, I, I can't say that I'm a little sad, but only because we don't get a trailer sooner. And I really wanted a trailer <laughs> just so I can know and have peace of mind as to whether or not this movie is going to be decent or just a complete pile of garbage. Um, I, you know, I don't want to judge um, video game by its cover, but I think uh, just the sounds of it. It's, pile of garbage <laughs> might be gently way of putting it. Well, it's it doesn't help that it's Illumination who's behind it, whose track record has not been the greatest in terms of <laughs> in terms of like three D animated films. Sure, you know, compared to Pixar, Disney, which I mean they're basically the same. But uh, yeah, people were already skeptical, and now that they're delaying it, people are a little more like, well, I wonder what's going on there. Like, what's happening with the production? You know, movies production hell. Not usually a I'm good telling, it, formula. It, it got delayed. Chris Bratt's getting his name rubbed through the mud. Um, <laughs> you got a bad production house dealing with it. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm surprised that they didn't have something come out like Sonic to try to test for, te- like, do a uh, group, like a focus group. Yeah. And see, you know, but use America. Mm-hmm. Have the have the trailer drop and see how everyone felt about the animation. Yeah. I, I, I'm just, I want to see a trailer just so bad. Because I, 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 well, I, I want to have that peace of mind. I really want to see it like uh, someone completing uh, the Mario game on the N64 with a Chris Pratt voiceover. Mm. So they go like the wrong way both ways. Mamma mia. Yeah, but it's not him. It's him in his American accent. Oh, yeah. It's just lines taken from uh, Jurassic World and Tomorrow no. War. <laughs> no, like they give him the script and it's just like, just be Chris Pratt. But they use, <laughs> instead of filming it, they just like film someone completing Mario 64. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Wahoo. Bowser, I'm going to get you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Stand down, Bowser. Oh, my God. Luigi, you met- get over here. The plot of Mario is Mario 64. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> there's three acts right there. Though. Well, that I know. The plot of Mario 64 is basically the plot of every main Mario game, oh. which is uh, Princess Peach gets kidnapped by Bowser, 
Mario goes and beats Bowser and then yeah. saves Princess Peach. Yeah, I heard and, Ron Perlman's playing Bowser. Oh. <laughs> no, that's a joke. <laughs> that, that wouldn't be a bad fit, though. No, no, until you find out they're doing live action. Oh, uh, yeah. Well, it's that would be an especially great fit, oh, I yeah. think. Ron Perlman as Bowser in a live action Mario movie. Yeah. So I would, if it were live action, I would want to definitely Ron Perlman. I would want to keep Charlie Day as Luigi, even yep. though he's kind of short and Luigi's supposed to be the tall one. And then you just cast someone shorter than. Oh, like Danny DeVito. Yeah. No. <laughs> Not as Mar. Maybe Waluigi. I was just. Well, Wario would or probably War- be a better. Yeah, fit Wario. For, so, okay. Adrian Brody as Waluigi. Because he's kind of like a tall, lanky yeah, dude. Yeah, 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 yeah. And he had the little mustache in Grand Budapest, so he can pull it off. Yeah, and in uh, Midnight in Paris. Yeah, that's true, as uh, Salvador Dali. And then uh, Danny DeVito is Wario. Yep. And then uh, who should be Mario? Gianluigi Leguizamo. Oh, it goes back full circle. Oh, man, it's big time. <laughs> <laughs> it's the same cinematic universe. <laughs> that would be, oh, my God. We're making we're making the movie better than it probably already is. Wow, yeah, you you write the script, I got the production down. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or we'll just find someone who can beat Mario 64 in two and a half hours. The script that I write is just going to be uh one page and one sentence. It's just going to be Princess gets kidnapped, Mario goes saves Princess, the end. Yeah. I guess that's three sentences, but still. It's all right. Yeah. It reads well. Mhm. I didn't go to school for math. I went to school for English. <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so if you guys are listening and wondering why it might sound a little more echoey, it's because we got a new recording location. That's right. For our Moving podcast. On up. I, I moved house. I, I moved out of uh, where I used to live, which is where we recorded mm-hmm. in Gideon's old room, which I turned into my, my office so, so nicely. It looks pretty decent. Honestly. Yeah. I'm yeah. proud of myself. Yeah. But n- now we are in a new location because I bought a house and, uh... I, I I made a whole bedroom into the podcast room, basically. Yeah, it's clean, man. This looks. It's gonna be a nice little. Um, it's gonna turn into something. Yeah, I I don't have any decorations up yet. It's just uh, you know plain walls for the most part with, with some curtains hanging up, but. <laughs> You know, it gives it that sort of like <laughs> kind of it's going somewhere feel. <laughs> in, in, yeah, right now it feels intimidating. <laughs> I don't. I, I I look around and I definitely get a feel of like, man, this is this is about to become something. So, I yeah, I have I have posters already that I need to put up. I just haven't because right. I still have a little bit of touching up to do in here. Mm-hmm. Like I need to paint the trim and everything. Yeah, but. there's. I mean, it could. It's definitely got. You know, I want. I want. I wouldn't be upset. If this was like the sexiest part of the the house. Uh, you know, well, like this has got that kind of. You wouldn't be upset because it's going to be the part that you're going to spend the most time in. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Ulterior motives. Um, but no, I still have to. Uh, well, I did a lot of like updating and painting, and um, I painted like the trim. I painted the walls. The walls used to be kind of like a cream color, and now they're nice and bright. So it looks it looks like a bigger room. It um, does. It feels nice. Yeah. The floor is like pretty decent. It's a little dinged up, but you know, nothing that a little spit shine can't fix, I guess, in in the future. It's a, it's weird cuz it's a little uneven. Like there's a the bit floor, of a, yeah. yeah, the floor is it's got a bit of a tilt. I had to like adjust my desk so it wasn't like tipping over. But you know, it's it's working. It's fine. Are you looking at my... <laughs> Just checking it out. You said something. The, le- yeah, the leveling. I wanted to see. I was like, is it really? like? Can I, will I be able to see like one that's like eight inches off the ground and one that's two? Yeah. You know, like, And it's like, oh, man, that's pretty sturdy. The but way, it doesn't look sturdy. The way you turned back was like I told you that you were... It's it's as if you were just making fun of like the lunch lady, and then she appeared behind you. And, no, and then I told you that she's right behind you. No, it's a, it was a subtle like oh I didn't I definitely would have noticed that. I know the flooring's like a little uneven, but not enough to where a readjustment of the desk. So I was like I wonder how like crazy this thing's readjusted. Yeah, uh, you know like I, I get, if I was like yeah I had to fix up my car and you like look at my car for it to drive straight like half of it was elevated and the other half was sunk and it's like <laughs> wow that looks smooth like it doesn't look good at all but it drives smooth yeah yeah uh you know the only reason I gave you the office chair is in case you like start rolling away I'm nice and sturdy but I feel good I feel solid yeah. I got a nice base going you do yeah you I always I always tell people Mac has a pretty nice base thank you that's what I like to tell people too when I first meet them mm-hmm. so that way they don't come up and try to like cold cock me yeah you know start establish that dominance real yeah. quick <laughs> oh yeah firm handshake look in the face squat down uh-huh 
Um, so yeah, new location. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll post some like behind the scenes pics, some like before and afters. Cause I did take some pictures of the old place, um, long time ago. So I'll have to dig them up, but just for like comparison's sake. Um, yeah, I think that'd be interesting. Pot it up, pot it up. Um, speaking of pot it up, uh, it's a movie podcast. It is. <clears throat> speaking of movies, uh, <laughs> We saw two of them. We we did see two of them. I've um, saw more than I've seen more than two, but the two that are here that we'll talk about. I've same seen. here, same yeah. here. I think uh, next episode we can, uh, depending on what you saw or what your intentions are, we can maybe talk about the Northman because I saw that. Oh, you did. Mm-hmm. Oh, I'm gonna have to see it. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, definitely one that I encourage people to go to theaters to see. Oh, because it's uh. Eggers had a, a ninety million dollar budget and it made like twenty million opening weekend. I don't even know if it even made that, but uh, it, it's not looking like it's going to be a box office success. So I want to encourage people to go see that because people vote with their wallets, and I'd like to see more movies like this. So, nice. Okay, that's a ringing endorsement. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'd be excited to talk about it. Um, but anyway, we saw uh, everything everywhere all at once. Uh, which is the new A24 movie. Um, yep. Do you want to get into that first? We can. either. Yeah, let's do that one. I mean, you brought it up. You said it. I did. The name's out there. I dropped it on the table. Might as well talk about it. All right. Sounds good. <laughs> so anyways, let's talk. About, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, Everything, everywhere, all at once. Yeah, I'll look up. I'll you look got up it? On this. Yeah. Um, so this is a movie directed by the Daniels. Yeah, Quan is it Quan? Uh, Daniel, Daniel Quan and uh, let me every Lithgow, uh, Fairchild. So directed by Dan Quan and Daniel Scheinert. Yeah, I believe that's how you pronounce that name. If I'm pronouncing it wrong, I'm sorry, Daniel. I'm sure you're listening. Um, please, and, cr- please find us on Twitter and correct us. Yes, please. Uh, at Neon Crew Podcast. <laughs> Mac runs it, so it's all him. Oh yeah, it's it's doing. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> um, so this movie uh, is directed by the same guys that did Swiss Army Man. Yeah. Uh, we talked about that a little bit on our A24 episode. Yeah. Well, Gideon, I hadn't seen it. So I know Gideon kind of told me about it. And um, yeah, it, it, and which was funny because. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you still haven't seen Swiss Army Man? No. Okay. No. Having seen. Well, I guess we can uh, we can get into like the synopsis first. So I'll do that. You do that. I'll one. do that if You'll you want to do that do one. I'll do the other one. The yeah, the ma- the harder one. The one with a thousand different stories going on. I'll leave that one to you. We'll turn it into a math pod. Yeah, <laughs> it's already getting there. Yeah, I already had to go from one to three <laughs> earlier. Um, so this movie uh, stars Michelle Yu. I believe that's how you pronounce it, uh, and she plays Evelyn Kwan, and uh, she is someone who. Is kind of like in her fifties, runs a runs a laundromat, um, you know, just with her husband and her daughter, and uh, she's also looking after her father who's visiting from China because he's got some health issues. Yeah. Um. So this movie is basically about her trying to live her life, and she's always constantly busy, and uh, she's really hard on her daughter. She has like really high expectations for her that are very uh, unrealistic to meet for anybody kind of the same way her father treated her and then uh she finds out that she is connected to all these different things happening in the multiverse um she finds out that uh there are many different versions of her that have all these different talents and interests and unique qualities about them that she doesn't possess but then she can channel those uh different versions of herself into uh her current timeline and apply them to uh, situation and the situation being uh, this villain coming after her mm-hmm. to consume everything in the multiverse. I believe. <laughs> yeah, that one was a little. I don't think it wasn't. It was a little hazy on the goal. Yeah. Uh. Well, it, it is a movie that you can easily get lost in because there's so much going on. It. Um, it really is. I honestly, I approached it kind of like Tenant. When Mm -hmm. I got to a certain point, (laughs) it wasn't like you're getting lost in it. But if you're definitely trying to, if you're trying to apply it to like a real world, like if this were really happening right now, 
yeah. you know, I think it's easy to get, it would be easy to get lost in it. Yeah, it'd be a difficult task. And I, that's what was kind of happening to me. So I, I started going with uh, a little bit of the, the mind swapping as mm. uh, a red herring for yeah. some of what was going on. It was just kind of like a vehicle to get from point to point. So I don't know if there was a metaphor driven within that or if it was just his way to instill some of the silliness that was probably needed in a very heartfelt movie. Yeah, uh, so I was going to make this point before um, going into the summary. Having seen Swiss Army Man, it's a very similar vibe. I, Dude, ab- after the first 20 minutes, I was like, this is very Swiss Army Man. Like, I, I, I was watching it, and I just mm. went, I bet you get anyone like this. There's a lot of different slapstick elements. There's a lot of just quirky humor mm-hmm. and kind of random stuff that happens. But it serves... It serves a purpose in the world that it's in, and it's got a lot of heart behind it, yes. much like Swiss Army Man does. Yes, um, you can definitely see it coming through. I'm, I'm trying to figure out whether or not I like this movie better than Swiss Army Man because Swiss Army Man is a little more. I don't want to say grounded because it is about a corpse who farts and goes around the water. I while think farting. both both of them have their have their uh differences that mm-hmm. make it like um whimsical and um god i don't even know what to call it it's not is this one sci-fi uh i would say it is like i want to say kind like of a, like some matrix elements going on oh it was bit. very matrixy this is, I had this a, is a better matrix movie than matrix i had a real feel that these guys kind of took some of those 90s um time traveling mm-hmm. or 90s um sci-fi elements and kind of took the tropiness of them yeah. and poked fun at them. I, I think so. I definitely got that same exact feel for Like this it. had kind of like, we're going to poke fun at the, at the at the multiverse with the Doctor Strange and the Spider-Mans and we get to poke fun at the Matrix mm-hmm. and we're poking a little bit of fun at uh, like Inception. Yeah. Um, we're po- you know, and there's like, uh, he's on a whole nother planet or a whole nother universe and his whole thing. So I'm, I'm trying to maybe a little Terminator in there, you know, I definitely felt kind of like the Inception influence towards the end. That like whole sequence of climaxes yeah. that just keep happening over and over yes. and over again. And you cut like to the different timelines and the different perspectives of like what's going on. Yeah. But it's all it's all connected still. It was it very all coincides f- very well. Oh my god, it was So is that the is that are we doing that for the summary? Like you're wrapping up the summary? Yeah. It just just balls of the walls into this thing i think so okay if, if like, people have like seen this movie and they want to hear us talk about it they'll understand <laughs> yeah what we're what we're saying and where we're coming from. yeah i was about to yeah and if you haven't we didn't really give anything away i would if you haven't seen it, i would actually just turn this off right now and go see it yeah not to say that that's what i think of it but Ooh. no no spoilers for your thoughts yeah <laughs> um but yeah, let's hop. Let's just do it man. Let's just go. Let's just jump into it. All right quoting uh philly d Philip DeFranco, good old YouTube newsboy. Oh, yeah, of Um, course. How could I forget? (laughs) How could I forget? (laughs) Um, This movie was a lot of fun. Oh, my God. So first and foremost, I want to say this before anything else. So I watched this movie in theaters. Yes. uh, There weren't that many people in the theater when I saw it. Maybe like 12. Same uh, Same with ours. Yeah. It was a smaller theater, and there were definitely not that many people. But it wasn't like empty. So the funny moments that garnered a lot of laughter, you could hear like a good amount of people laughing oh, at the really? movie. Yeah. So You're like lucky. most of the, Oh no, 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 you didn't. A lot of the funny moments were me laughing out loud. Oh, yeah. Doing my, yeah. <laughs> so anyway, go on. That it would was, be, that would be almost funnier than uh, the movie itself. It probably was. I don't, those poor people to be a fly on the wall in that moment. Um, so the movie ends and I'm sitting there, because I, I went and saw it by myself, and I'm sitting there thinking to myself, that is probably one of the best movies I've seen in theaters in a long time. Uh, and then this couple in front of me, like probably around my age, the girlfriend turns to her boyfriend and says, you owe me after that one. That was such a fucking awful movie. And then they stand up and hurriedly leave the theater. Wow. After after she said that. I'm thinking, I'm thinking to myself, like, damn. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That boy owes her some money. That is, that is a hard <laughs> stance. And, you know, people can think what they want about movies. You know, yeah, it's I, fine. I really honestly do. Like, I don't think. I I just thought I it was funny. easily could see people being very distracted by this. Mm-hmm. Um, off put, not relating to the characters. And 
because it's not a A B C D plot line, yeah, um, very easily being turned off. There is there's not a whole lot of thinking, but there's a lot of um, there's a lot of different themes. What do you call it? anecdotes or metaphors or yeah. whatever you want to kind of view it as? I mean, it's it's all right there for your kind of interpretation of how you want to apply it. Mm-hmm. Um, so. I could, I mean, I could see people at, after the first probably 25, 30 minutes for me, I was like, what the fuck am I watching? Yeah. I can definitely see people thinking that this movie is just stupid. Oh, yeah. For all the like different types of humor and like kind of the slapstick stuff going on. It's you way know. too quirky. Yeah. The guy's head exploding with confetti and the whole butt plug scene <laughs> that was Wait, yeah check off gun i've never seen a butt <laughs> plug used as a you know check off gun used as a butt plug yeah i like, i saw those statues in jamie lee curtis's office which by the way she was great in this movie she i had yes i don't know i had a weird uh, she, i'm not used to seeing her like that you're, yeah she's like she's basically one of the like villains in this movie she like is a minor a, I mean, villain she's she's yeah she's probably like a, a story b's villain yeah yeah you know uh when when she had all those like butt plug trophies she's you like, knew it was funny too because you saw him and you're like oh that looks like a butt plug and then you're watching like i bet you that gets used at some point yeah. and then i forgot about them until they got back into that scene and they both look <laughs> at it and i was like you gotta be shitting me. at least Part of yeah the pun. they they acknowledge the fact that it looks as ridiculous as it looks because oh yeah I love her line, like, you don't make auditor of the year without with uh, going easy on people or like. Oh, yeah. No, it was definitely all of it was well intended. I mean, with her job and what she was doing and then to have that, I was like, that's pretty that's pretty on the nose. Sort of a commentary on the IRS in a way. Oh, yeah. What they do to you. Uh (laughs) Yeah. And her taking extreme pleasure in doing it. This movie would be so much fun to watch again, just to look for how many different like hidden bits that the Daniels threw in there just for people to find. Oh, Easter eggs. Yeah. yeah. Just like different implications that they mean to, and like how they coalesce with what's going on in the scenes. I, I think that'd be a lot of fun. Yeah. I would, there was a little bit of, that was some of the curiosity that I had. Cause you're kind of watching it when you do pick up on like what's happening. Um, I think that you're able to kind of like branch out a little bit as long as, and I would say, don't get really hell bent on trying to like, go with each universe and following the trail Mm -hmm. you know i think it's uh it helps too that like if you watch this movie i think it helps to like focus on the characters themselves and not necessarily like the plot because the characters are what carry this movie 100 percent um you know michelle Yu as uh evelyn is is very uh like a heavy character driven person you know she she goes through this change in this film uh, going from like this kind of like husk of a person who's always busy and never has time for her family to somebody who can actually appreciate her daughter and her husband and her father and like all these different people in her lives that she basically just takes for granted because she feels that her time is not important enough for them. Yeah. You know, yeah, it's to the point where she doesn't even know how to like communicate with her daughter. She's oh, just... it was you. Yeah. <laughs> when they had, um... what she, she say to her? Joy. It, she like stops, looks at her. You're getting fat. Stop eating so much. <laughs> it was there was it was funny because I was like, uh, I watched it and um, I was I sit there and it's like, yeah, she really had no idea how to talk to her daughter. That that was how she filled the void. Mm-hmm. Well, she couldn't have any sort of heartfelt commentary or relationship with her. That that's what she had to say. Yeah, and it was funny too because they actually bring it back. But when she says it to her, you know, towards the end of the film, it's actually more of like kind of what you should be as a mother. Yeah, you know, like looking out for your child and saying like in a in a not an endearing way, but more of like I'm concerned yeah, about your exactly a place of concern. Whereas yes. like before, it was more so like she just didn't know how to communicate. with Exact her. like a hundred percent. So that was yeah. I mean that was that was fun. I'm trying to think of like all the I watching this i think we get to about probably about the be- end of act two maybe the beginning of act three probably the end of act two when uh the husband comes back into the scene mm-hmm. when she kind of meets up with the the villain and and the husband comes you know and you think like all is lost like here we go yeah like she's falling into the bagel mm-hmm. and uh the husband comes back into the scene that's when it really turned like for me i was like I fucking love this movie. Yeah. This movie, it, it's it's so jam-packed with, like, all this different stuff going on. And, like, 
the <laughs> the the daughter being the villain, I think is a is a nice touch because it's it makes the villain uh, very sympathetic. Obviously, like you know where she's coming from, mm-hmm. and like you can identify with like her struggles. Somebody who whose parent like really doesn't preach like the the villain was basically right this whole movie like they 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 I mean their goals and like what they wanted to accomplish weren't right well it's hard to say I'm because I'm not disagreeing yeah I mean, their the, reasoning was her her plight justified. wasn't um her plight wasn't out of so everyone everyone thought it was to destroy the multiverse mm-hmm. but when you're with her it, I didn't really feel that that was it. I don't know. Yeah, just filled with resentment and like wanting to kind of like teach teach her mom a lesson, like a, a very nihilistic approach on on the outlook of life. Yeah, and the bagel. I think the bagel for me represented like depression, and I mean, like she said, nothing matters. So we just throw it into this bagel, and it just gets consumed. Yeah, and it's easier to it's easier to give up and and succumb. Than it is to fight back. Yeah, and that's what the, the you know any sort of any sort of like emotion giving, giving that I, everything up to the bagel. Yeah, everything. And that's why I was like, all right, I get the bagel, but it's like this doesn't feel like this is impacting everyone. Mm-hmm. It just feels like she's growing stronger as this person, you know. But like the bagel, I don't know. I and maybe if she had taken down Evelyn, you know, then. We're looking at a different sort of movie, but mm-hmm. um, no, I, 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 the her, when they had some of their scenes together, it wasn't like you were ever really worried or concerned that something was going to happen. It was kind of like where, what's going, how, how do they fight? Like what is it? And it was very like it was kind of like an argument that you have, like when when you're going through some of that uh, teenage change. Yeah, you know, it's where, like it's like how how do these two characters feel about each other at the end of this? situation yeah and well and and you evelyn starts to see more of the perspective of the daughter and why that she's creating the bagel and there's no fighting or anything i mean it's really just her explaining it and bringing evelyn everything that evelyn ever wasn't able to ever process or feel Mm -hmm. and she was starting to see what it was doing to her daughter yeah it's evelyn learning what her daughter is trying to get across to her and then finally using that lesson that she's been taught and applying it to solve what her daughter wants to accomplish. Yeah. Um, you know, it's a, it's a fairly like straightforward, you know, daughter, mother, like kind of situational relationship thing, but it's presented in a way that's very creative and, uh, almost mind boggling. Sometimes I was eye Googling (laughs) with all the googly eyes. Oh yeah. 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 Um, now I, I'm going to look at googly eyes a totally different way now because of this movie. I loved what they did with the rocks. Yeah. <laughs> like <that> was... <laughs> the way it turned and then just the eyes just jiggling back and forth. Oh my God. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, uh, yeah, this movie is very funny. I thought it was very heartfelt, you know, definitely like that Daniel style. That's very similar in Swiss army, man. Um, what did you think of, uh, her husband, Wayman? So, uh, watching it, um, <laughs> The guy's voice was so so shrill, I yes. want to say. And I'm watching it, and I was like, I think that's like short stuff from the Indiana Jones and the Temple it of is, Doom. It is short round. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, watch. I was like, is that the same? And I'm, so I'm like, at the end of it, I was like, that's, that's got to be him. Mm-hmm. That's got. And he hadn't been in anything for like 20 years. No, this is, I think, uh, one of the first movies he's been in in a long time and since he was a young boy. Loved. He was, he was probably like one of my – he was probably – I, I mean, he he might be my favorite character in all of this. He's great. I mean, I I really I mean, just he's from, a good foil for um for Evelyn because Evelyn's so like busy and like into her own head that she just doesn't like she doesn't appreciate her family. And then Wayman is just like all over the place, joyful and happy, and like tries his best to like find the positives and everything. Oh yeah, well he has. I mean, one well, he has to, but I mean he you kind of learn. I mean that was the. That was a risk he took with her, mm-hmm. and it never. I mean, you obviously don't get to see his side of the story, but you know, everything led to that point of "come with me," and she said yes. So, yeah, you know, along the the same sort of uh, line of thinking with him and like the action scenes that go on, I really like the the action choreography in this movie. Fantastic! It was so much fucking better than Matrix Resurrections. It was there was it was obviously stylized. There was some stuff where mm-hmm. it was like, you know, obviously we got some people that are a little older, so there's some takes that were 
uh, one shots, and then there was some stylized takes, but they had fun with it. I mean, it was just one of those things where they, it 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 never broke the mood. Yeah, <laughs> you know, definitely. It was one of those things I was kind of curious about too. I was like, I wonder if she's gonna get any better, or if we start to see more. It always stayed about the same, mm-hmm. you know. And yeah, I thought it was my probably my one of my favorite scenes was uh, fanny pack nunchucks. I mean, oh that, yeah, like that was I love that scene. Mm-hmm. Uh, I really liked. Um obviously like the SWAT stuff, like her, like swinging the SWAT thing around, like the shield, yep. uh, with like the smoke going on. The butt plug scene definitely stands out. Cause it's such a, <laughs> it's such yeah, like a it, goofy sequence. It was, I mean, it was like, I, ha- I was laughing. I mean, when you kind of see what's happening, but then the one guy, <laughs> he gets it and then it doesn't go away. So I thought that was pretty funny. Mm-hmm. I was like, that's, there you go. There's some, uh, what continuity. Yeah. They're just jammed up in there yeah. <laughs> forever. <laughs> so that was pretty funny. And then like, uh, I don't think there was really, uh, her fight scene, the daughter's fight scene. Um, when she gets into the, breaks into the, uh, building. Oh yeah. That was pretty like when she turned the cops head to confetti. Yeah. I was like, oh, this is. Here we go. That, yeah, that was, you know? that was very, that's quite the entrance. Well, because you got to think, too, like, up to that point, we had we had switched into the multiverse, so mm-hmm. you kind of had a little bit of that um, unrealisticness that's happening, right? Uh, the father just got into, like, this nunchuck fight with his fanny pack, which is like, okay, like, I've seen Jackie Chan do sh- shit like that. Yeah. You know? It's a fucking good scene. So you don't really know, and then all of a sudden she does that and turns that guy's head to confetti, and I was like, anything's game now. Mm-hmm. Like, that's what kind of was like, all right, here we go into the... And then it just got even quirkier. Yeah. Which I really appreciated, too. They didn't really... They kind of hinted to where we were obviously going, mm. and then it was just unrelenting, and I don't think... It never got dull or dry. No. You know, which was nice. I think it helped that they just kept that creative energy up. Like they just kept doing what they thought would be just fun and just really in line with the theme that they were going for, which is just kind of like this bonkers batshit thing with this this heartfelt story in there that you yeah. can definitely get out of. Um, yeah, no, just a really good film. Um, I don't know if uh, <laughs> I don't think there's. A, too much else to say about it i don't think it's i mean there's a lot to say about it for sure it's well it's one of those things like you said it's a very simple plot Mm -hmm. it's very it's one of those things like when you so i've told a couple people i was like when i you know personally that's what i feel like when you watch it you can easily get lost in trying to keep up with like uh where's she going what's going on some of the side stories or at least some of the side characters Mm mm-hmm but if you just hold true to like, you know, this is, you know, mother, daughter trying to, you know, a little bit of that. I don't know. I mean, and it was kind of her hero's journey, too, which yeah. is I thought like a, I thought they were going to flip it on its head and like, you know, have the daughter kind of come out like as a sympathetic villain. And then all of a turn, you know, turn into turn into somebody irredeemable. Well, yeah. And then what, what really happens, I mean, you really find out that this is passed on through generations, you know, and it's. And she does come out ahead of him. She discovers a lot about herself, which mm-hmm. I thought it was really it's re, it's remarkable to do that with. I think we're we're at with movies, mm-hmm. you know, to have that to have those points come across. Um, have you seen Turning Red? No, this I've is, I've heard of it. That's the new Pixar movie, right? Yeah, this is like very. I don't know what's going on here, but it's two very similar movies yeah isn't that one about a mother-daughter relationship that's not the best yeah um yeah i think i saw an article pop up that said something along the lines of uh the the toxic mother relationship in in movies i was talking to my friend about it too and i i we're i was just like i wonder why and this isn't a you know uh, anything against asian americans i was just curious as to why they're depicting that relationship because I think it's, um, I, I think it's sort of a thing. Uh, it's called like Tiger Moms. Oh, it, really? So yeah, this is a true. Yeah, it's sort of like uh, this sentiment. I think it's like a almost purely Chinese sentiment, but it's essentially where mothers are so strict to their kids, because like a lot of um, like Chinese moms will want their kids to like oh. The, go play like violin or like play right. these sports or like do this sort of thing. And like, they'll want them to like basically crunch at it 
And if like they slip up or anything, like the mother will just show sheer disappointment to the point where like the kid feels devastated. Right. Um, and it's sort of like a psychological thing, but yeah, tiger moms are, are definitely a thing. So that's probably why they depict them that way. Yeah, that makes sense. I was curious. I told, I mean, I was like, I don't know if it's a way of projecting, uh, seeing someone outside of your own culture, Mm -hmm. uh, and being able to, um, I don't want to say assimilate, but relate maybe a little bit more, or you're able, you're, you don't necessarily, you won't be projecting yourself on that, you know, as in like, this is my relationship with my parents. Like you can watch it from an outside perspective and have some reflection. Yeah. And I'm sure it definitely does like apply to people who aren't Asian either. You know, they just might have a strict mother. Oh, that, I mean, that, that goes, that relationship, it could have been anyone. Yeah. yeah. You know, I mean, it doesn't, I'm not looking at necessarily the nationality and saying like, it's only a, my my thing was like, all right, why why I've seen now two films that are involving this really, but Tiger Mom, I mean that Tiger Moms makes sense, and also if you think about the heritage, you know, you know there might be something with family tradition being passed down, and we start to see it's it is family tradition, but maybe it's a little bit more toxic than yeah. it is sort of like holding like some virtues or principles of the family name. I think part of it might be because in a lot of uh, kids cinema like when it was being made early on depicted parents as like these kind of uh almost godlike beings without fault you know Mm -hmm. we're always told to like respect our parents and like listen to our parents and our parents give like the best advice which can be true it depends on the situation but there's no doubt about it i think uh i think they're taking like a fresh look at that concept and kind of flipping it on its head where you know because like you think of toy story you know andy's mom was you know, she was a great mother. Um, well, I don't know if I'd use that one because she's like in it for all of 30 seconds. <laughs> well, <laughs> like, yeah, she's going to be a great mom. She's not there. <laughs> and, and, Andy seems a little more well adjusted than Sid across the street. Um. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, that's there's a lot. Yeah, I wouldn't really. You'd have to dive into the parent aspect. I, yeah, I'm I can't not, really get into the psychology of Andy's well, mom. <laughs> and, well, and what happened in both these films, though, you get to see how the parents, how their emotions and how their parenting styles is reflected. Mm-hmm. Like it's not. It wasn't by their choice. It's how they were raised. Yeah, it's it's and, very hereditary. Yeah, I don't see. That's the one thing I was saying too. Like I don't know. Is it hereditary or is it? I mean. What if the dad had accepted her leaving in this film? Yeah, or she would be you know, a lot more well, I mean, totally circumstantial. You know what I'm saying? Like it was. It's just an interesting reflection that I've seen now in two films about two families being that of Asian American and, um, you know, kind of being represented and, and what they're. I, I don't. I didn't. I just didn't know if it was like marketing or if this is something. I mean, obviously the story is very important. Mm-hmm. So to get this out. It makes sense, but I mean, in the same token, too, I mean, you get to see how these moms were, because you haven't seen Turning Red, but it was the same scenario with the overbearing parent. Yeah. And you get to see how uh, the mom of the protagonist is, um, why the way she is. So. Yeah. Kind of gives it that, like, nuanced perspective, which I enjoy. I like the fact that, you know, there's no, like, one-dimensional take on it, you know, that it happens for a reason. Mm-hmm. And it makes the, it helps make the characters feel more realistic that's the thing like all this crazy shit is happening in the movie the characters feel like people you could meet in real life you know they have all these different nuances and personalities and like they have they have yeah. you know sadness and happiness and like weakness and all the all these different things going on Oh, they in this one yeah, they had a wide range of emotions yeah, yes. it was very they, there was a lot even even with Hot dog fingers. Um, <laughs> yeah. Like, I've never been able to, I couldn't believe that they made me care about that relationship in that world. Uh huh. <laughs> you know? Hot dog finger Jamie Lee Curtis and hot dog finger Michelle Yu. <laughs> yeah. And it's funny, too, because you don't even think about them not being able to do anything with their hands. And then you finally see Jamie Lee Curtis playing the piano, like, kind of crying, you know, mm-hmm. playing with her feet. Yeah, yeah. And it's like, oh shit like they would have to do it. and then they really h- harness that, that <laughs> energy and i was like that is freaking hysterical the the cutaway to the the apes dueling with the normal hands <laughs> the versus the, versus the hot dog hand apes <laughs> yeah and like the normal human hand ape losing so <laughs> it was very she tra- she yeah what transferred into a whole nother uh <laughs> like, i can't even think like uh what do they call it anyways yeah uh this movie had like it had like four endings i felt like at one point and i enjoyed it that way um i thought it like fit with the whole like kind of holding on to like what you have 
sort of feel that it was going for. But like Wayman gets stabbed, it's like, oh shit. That's mm-hmm. like the climax. And then <laughs> and then like Evelyn comes in and you know, you think that she's gonna she's gonna like go with her mom, like after her mom chases her down the road, that's gonna be the end, and then like uh Joy refuses and then it's like, oh no, that's the end. And then she goes towards the black hole bagel and it's like, oh no, that's the end. Yeah. Like, there's like four different endings happening all in this movie. It wasn't I mean it just it kinda it just kinda like would it w- there's like some waves. There'd be a wave. Like you get a peak and then a, a valley and then a peak and then a valley, you know, and it was it was really well done though, because I, I don't think at any one point uh you thought like, all right, I want this to like let's yeah, oh, yeah. Damn. Like it's it was kind of like what are they honestly? Because for me it was the black hole. Like when they were sitting there talking, and Joy's like nothing. Like there are rocks, and she's like, "This isn't this nice. It's peaceful. Like mm. there's no one here. We're all fucking idiots. We make really dumb choices, and we can just come here and forget everything and just be you know just relax. And it's like, oh yeah, we can. And the dad at that point was out, and I was like. Well, how the fuck? Like, what's going on? Like, how does she get back? Uh huh. <laughs> and then when he, you know, it, it, then he pops up, and I was like, "Oh my!" That's when I mean, really for me, that was my selling point. Was like, man, they got me so invested that I really just didn't think that that was. I really didn't believe anything was gonna like that was kind of it, and she would have to do some sort of realization as a rock. Yeah, this this movie really got me invested into watching two rocks talk to each other. Yeah, with text on screen. <laughs> it was. It was. Yeah. <laughs> This, it was, this movie accomplished so much. And it was weird, too, because some people told me it flew by. I was like, no, I mean, for me, this did feel like it was two hours and 20 minutes, but, like, it's a nice, it's kind of like a jog. Like, you're going on a jog, and there's times where you're like, oh, fuck, you're pant. And then there's times where you're like, man, I feel pretty good. You yeah, know? you got and then, the, the joggers high. Well, and then by the end of it, when you stop, yeah, you're like, oh, holy shit, like, that was awesome. Yeah. You know, but, like, there's a there's moments where you're going through it, and jogs never feel, I mean, I shouldn't say it, it's like, crazy like a jock sometimes they drag but you know sometimes like you get going all of a sudden 10 minutes are binary fuck yeah jogs are different Mm -hmm. like you know jogs are like movies you know you have a good jog a a bad jog could have a jog at the beach a jog in the in the park jog with two rocks Mm Mm-hmm. a jog with my socks oh i might fall and slip but that's okay (laughs) as long as i don't die um So Good disclaimer. Was there anything you had in terms of like criticisms? Um, I don't really think I had too much of. Uh, I wasn't like the the hot dog fingers wasn't my favorite. No, uh, me neither. But I, I thought for everything that. Um, well, go ahead. I mean, do you have any criticisms? I really don't. I, mean, I don't I, think I. I really do. I think the pacing was really good. I thought the acting was phenomenal, and the characters were all fun and interesting. I don't think there was a. I don't think there was like a boring character in the movie. Um, they all like served their purpose and they had enough nuance to, you know, keep me invested. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I thought it was just really solid all around. Um, I don't yeah. know. What about you? No, I'm in the same boat. I didn't. I um, for every critique that I might have had, um, they kind of answered it. Mm-hmm. So it was kind of you know with the hot dog hands, I wasn't a fan of that either. But then. In that little universe right there, they made me care about that relationship. I thought that was pretty special. Yeah. Uh, and the fact that they can make me laugh about that, even as rocks, mm-hmm. you know? So I don't think there was any one time where they pulled a punch that I was like, nah. Um, I think the only thing that I might have been a little upset about might have been like the fighting choreography. I mean, okay. It's just like you can kind of tell when they were like, obviously we got to get some young people that we can dress up so we can have this, mm, you yeah. know, and I would have liked to see maybe a little bit more of the actors doing it, but like, that's like really just small, small change. Yeah. Small potatoes. Yeah. Like I didn't, I, it wasn't enough other than that, man. Like it was, yeah. Yeah. I really think, I think, I think this, I could watch this movie again, probably have the same, same viewing from it, mm-hmm. uh, but there's probably a lot more Easter eggs that we could take away or things that would that pop up that you don't know about that would show up later in the film. Oh yeah, that you might catch on to. This movie definitely feels like it benefits from multiple watches for sure. Yeah, I'm excited to uh, to hear what more people think about it. It's currently one of the highest rated movies on Letterboxd. Dude, like it was it was I, number one for a while. I IMDb, think, it's like an eight point nine. Yeah, I think. Excuse me, I think Parasite uh, overtook it again on after, letterbox after, yeah on letterbox after a while because parasite has been number one since it's been out really yeah it's the average score is like a 4.6 wow yeah hmm. 
It's it's one of the high. It's the highest rated movie on there, uh, ever. <laughs> <laughs> interesting yeah just like the sheer amount and like the the amount of like high ratings too um but everything everywhere all at once is up there but yeah i first time i got on imdb where i saw a feature length film that was like above an eight or an eight five like yeah it, it's like i because i wanted to see if it was short round and then you know mm-hmm. so i was like uh let me see and then i click i was like 8.9 i was like what the fuck yeah it's it's crazy because like most of the movies on the top 250 are like 7.5s or something, right? Like that's the highest that they get. This, yeah, I, I'm, I'm serious. Like I don't, I don't know how you go into. The, I don't that chick that saw. Like I don't know. She must not have connected with anything and thought it was just way over the top with its quirkiness. Because like, even, I don't know how you go into this thing and don't laugh. I, I, yeah, I wonder what she was expecting from it. Like going, like was she just going with her boyfriend, and her boyfriend really wanted to see it, and she knew nothing about it, yeah. or did she just expect something totally different? Even if she watched like trailers or like saw posters or something, like the silliness, I could see being like a little off putting. But I mean, the dude, it's I mean, it's wholesome towards the end. Yeah, it's got heart. It's got characters that you care about. 100 percent and that you can connect with that maybe she just didn't connect with the characters i'm telling like that's the only way i think is if you don't buy into the silliness but you and you can't get behind the characters yeah so yeah i'm not sure i'm not sure what she was expecting again people can have their opinions on movies yeah yeah. and if you're listening to the show sorry but you're a fucking idiot (laughs) (laughs) i i did think to myself i i i would break up with her if i (laughs) yeah on the spot yeah it's like we're done do it and then and then so like it, have her walk out while you still sit there and listen to the music it's funny credits. too because the credits were rolling in and i almost said to watch the credits because i really like that song at the end of it yeah i was like this this is such a good film that like i you know what's a good film when the credits are rolling and you're still kind of like sitting there like lingering like do i sit here and watch them yeah like it's one of those movies that you just kind of have to sit back and let it absorb you know just kind of let it yeah marinate for a bit I also had to do that with Magnolia too, but oh, we'll, we'll get into okay. that. <laughs> we'll oh, get into that. Okay. Um. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot to talk about with that. A lot. That's why we saved it. I'm like, excited to hear your thoughts on that. So is this a pivot? Shit. Is this a transition? Is uh, this? Uh, are it we? Can be. Are we cut into scene two, act two? We're getting there, but I guess. Uh, what would you rate? Whoa! One okay. to fun. One being not so fun. And fun being more fun than in the sun. Yes. Um, definitely a fun. I'm giving this. I think I gave it like a nine out of ten. Mm-hmm. It, it, dude, and I only say that because like I think I love the story and how genuine it is and creative and wholesome. Mm-hmm. And I am like, because I'm a dumb jock. I've come to this realization where like all that stuff is like awesome, but I still need like my dumb it down moments yeah where i just don't have to process shit and i think i really appreciate that in films where some of like the higher concepts are the quirky i mean even this isn't even like that crazy you know but like i just it there's just a little bit like that i just i you know but it fuck it it's i don't know i might have gave it a 10 out of 10 on imdb i'd have to look i mean it's like right there yeah it's like right at the threshold i would have to say i'm in, in the same boat i would give this a nine out of ten yeah um that's why i give it on letterbox and i re- like i said i really don't have much of, like of, in the way of criticism i just think that personal preference i think there are movies that i like better than this you know what this is like what's that coda mm. i think coda got a nine out of ten too yep and it's the same vein. This is like a fucking souffle dessert. <laughs> it's so... It, I don't want to say easy because I could see this being hard, but if you can take it down easily, mm-hmm. like, it just... It's so smooth and heartwarming, but there isn't enough... Beh- I don't want to say behind it, but it's just like... It's a genuine story. Yeah. And you you know friends are... you know I mean, this is very, like... this is, It's relatable to the things that you've seen, you know, people see in their daily lives, but, like, it's a very... It, I, I don't know. I mean, I don't want to say it had me guessing, but I was never at that point where I was on the cusp of my seat wondering. Yeah. You know, you you weren't thinking to yourself like, oh, I wonder, like, I can't predict anything that's going to happen. Yeah. Well, I mean, and honestly, but at the same time, it still manages to like surprise you. Yeah. You know? Well, it's just, it's, it's a, and it, the, the, like I said, the, if the, if the bagel had a chance, so like you're seeing them suck down malt, like 
other universes, like all of a sudden you saw like, oh, we lost another one. The alpha verse got sucked into the bagel. Mm -hmm. Maybe then I'd be like, I mean, maybe. Was like, yeah. oh, just but, kinda like raise the stakes. I think that the bagel is just a giant metaphor and uh, you know, but it it pushed the point of where, you know, Joy and the relationship between Joy and Evelyn and kinda, you know, um it served the purpose of, of like probably projecting Joy's emotions. Mm -hmm. And it I I like that. I really did. I just it it just turned into a very genuine kind of family story, and but it was really well done. Like it's, I can't. This probably ties Coda for me, like in terms of like rewatchability. Yeah. I'd probably, if you said that, I'd go flip a fucking coin. <laughs> like you just tell me, and whatever it lands on, throw it on. Yep. No, no one way or the other. Yeah. So what about you? What do you? You got nine out of ten? Yeah, I would say nine out of ten. Yeah. Um, I would definitely say it's closer to a ten than an eight. Uh, oh, 100%. Just because this movie I, it has that little bit extra going on that I just really appreciate. I would probably put this on my top 50 favorite films list. Nice. Eventually. Yeah. Um, I haven't decided where exactly I'd want to put it, but it's it's there. I would I, say it's there. I bet you in like five years, like when you're kind of doing that, where you're talking with friends and you're just going on about, you know, 2022 or whatever movies and all of a sudden someone break, like people would be able to sit down and still remember it in five years and Dude. go over this fucking year is is good for movies, I think. Like we got the Batman, mm -hmm. we've got this film, yeah, we've got uh, Men coming out, which is a A twenty four movie with Jesse Buckley. Yeah, I mean, and yeah, that one I saw the trailer for that, and it's uh, that one will be interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got the Northman, which I fucking loved. Whoa, spoiler! So, redacted. Um, <laughs> yeah i gotta see a uh, friend of the pod uh hopefully we get to go out there and uh we're gonna check it out i'd like to see it probably sometime next week yeah but, i'd go see it again just to like oh one have it fresh in my mind but right. two just to go Do see like, it again like you did with the batman yeah yeah i would definitely go see it again for Dude. sure um uh morbius we got that uh hold on with go back scratch the record what now <laughs> 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 uh, uh, Jared Leto's magnum opus, yeah, is what I meant to say. Oh, oh, I've seen that one. Is he in that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Jared Leto, uh, vampire boy. Oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> just stop. <laughs> uh. <laughs> my my friend Drew and I have just been going around work saying it's Morbin time. No. Oh my god! Because we find it really fucking funny. <laughs> It bugs the hell out of people. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. And the the Oscar, well, I guess that would have been last year. So there have been some good films. And, I mean, there's some more that are going to come out that. Yeah. I mean, I think there's going to be the two Marvel movies that are coming out. I think oh, are going to yeah. be hits. Doctor Strange, uh, Doctor Strange 2 and Thor, Love and Thunder. Mm-hmm. Which, uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to those as well. I'm telling you, it could be a very, very 2020. We're back. Yeah. You know? We're we're back at the cinemas. Yes. Um, yeah, this this year, I think, is going to be a really good year for movies. Agreed. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, speaking of good year. Yeah. Uh, that blimp that came out in 2000 over the Super Bowl. Yeah. Along with. Along with. I don't know if it came out in 2000. It was 1999. Damn it. But that was the year before 2000. And it, it was also a good year. And it was a year that the film Magnolia came out. What? By Paul Thomas Anderson. Uh, so you recommended this film. I did. And I th think this was his film after Hard Eight. Uh, let me check his filmography just to make sure. Because actually, no, Boogie Nights, I think, came out before... I think Boogie Nights came out before this. So Hard Eight was his first film. Yes. And then he did Boogie Nights the year after. Yes. And then two years later, he did Magnolia. Yes, that's how it was... I couldn't remember if Hard Eight led to this or Boogie Nights. And then obviously he got this film. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I've it's been something... It's funny because I think my brother... Who's gonna be a special guest of the pod? Um, Shout out! He, I remember, uh, he was watching it in probably like his high school. Like we were both in high school, uh -huh. and I came down towards the ending. Which, if you walk down towards the ending, you're like, Jesus what the Christ. fuck are you watching? <laughs> it's fucking wild. Yeah, yeah. And I'm like, and I talked to him. He goes, I think it has to do with like, uh, 
uh, oh, fuck the Ten Commandments and shit. <laughs> yeah. You know, and I was like, Is that oh, verbatim? Well, what he, said? he didn't sound like that. That's how I sounded. Sam was probably like, uh, yeah, no, I think it's going to do something with Moses. Um, <laughs> so I was like, okay, that's bizarre. You know, not my type of movie. Mm-hmm. Don't see anyone kicking ass or fucking time hopping. Yeah. Uh, so I I put it off for a long time. And mm-hmm. then I was like, you know what? I got to really, I got to check it out. PTA is one of those, he's kind of, I don't, he's not controversial. Obviously, he doesn't have like any like really avant-garde or anything that's kind of no, experimental, he's very, but. Yeah, he's he's got a varied filmography, I would say. Yeah, like he's, yeah. He's really, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Like adaptable? Tormented. Oh, oh. what? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> let's go with uh, let's go with what I said. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah he's, a, he's a very like varied filmmaker. You know, 100%. He, makes, he makes a lot of different types of movies. You know, there will be blood, punch drunk love, which is like a romantic comedy, the master, which is like a character study, kind of like there will be blood in a way. And then you've got. I, I think he. Yeah, I think the. I think the production houses were like, we like that one so much. Let's get another one. Let's, right. And the subject and well. Yeah, Scientology. Anyways. Anyways, <laughs> and then you've got this film, which is a a, a three hour long, uh, behemoth of a movie, that, it really flew by for me. It. <laughs> I don't know if it did for you. This was like the shortest three-hour movie I think I've ever seen. Um, so because there's so much going dude, on, dude. It was insane. I mean, and the way he shoots it, it was. I don't know if it was like, all right, he's this is Oscar Beatty, or if it was just his kind of way of passing the perspective along. But there was so many tracking shots in this, and they're all well done. Yeah, they're like the uniqueness of the of the uh, cinematography of this film. Like, was, where did that come from? Was something that stood out to me the most. Yes. Because, like, other than, like, maybe a few instances of, like, Michael C. Hall, or is that his name? Michael C. Hall? Who? Yeah, the uh, the game show host? Uh, No. Thomas C. Riley? No, who's the, the guy who was at the bar pretty much the whole time? Oh, William H. Macy. William H. Macy. What did I say? Thomas C. Hall. Yeah, okay. Uh, you were close. Yeah, w- William H Macy. Like, uh, other than like a few shots of like his character, maybe in like certain situations, like no, no shot felt the same as the other. No, like it was really unique in the in the cinematography and like the way it was shot and like the presentation and it like served a purpose too. Had to. Have. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So, Probably. do you want to like give a, a summation of this film? If this, if you can. <laughs> uh this this. Uh, well, one opens up. You kind of understand how. Is, oh my god, it's not Jenkins. What's the guy? What's the dad's name? Uh, the Big Earl Productions was his. Uh, he was Earl something in this one. Uh, Earl. What the, Earl Partridge. Earl Partridge, and um, he he does the voice. I think he no, he doesn't even do the voiceover. That's not even him doing the voiceover. It felt like that was him. Like for some reason, I had it in my head that it was him, and you understood how he got into be bigger old productions. But um, it starts off with a couple stories that are all related, and the director starts off with not any like no coincidences go like are that are unrelated or mm-hmm. something along those lines. Like everything that happens happens for a reason. And it's all because like it coincides. Like you will find out six degrees of Kevin Bacon, you know why these happen, mm. and. Then you hop into real life, and we start following the stories of uh, Big Earl, who you find out is dying. Uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman, who's his nurse, yep. who's taking care of him, which had a really raunchy scene that I'm glad I didn't go where I thought it was going. Um, you had his his wife, and you're not really sure at the beginning if it's wife or the daughter mm-hmm. uh, until she kind of owns up to it. Um, uh, Heather, not Heather. Um, oh, Julianne Moore. Julianne Moore. Who's struggling a little bit with uh, some mental health issues? Um, you have Tom Cruise, who ends up you find he's uh, he's he's this motivational seduce and destroy. Yeah, very uh, <laughs> aggressive. <laughs> Train the cock, tr- tame the, the cunt. <laughs> yes, like that was. I think this might have been Tom Cruise's best role. He was. Uh, we'll get into okay. it. Okay. <laughs> uh, and uh, so he's he's this uh, big time guy that's he, he's got he's a motivational speaker, but he train he helps guys that are like with confidence issues. 
uh, get the get a loved one, you know, a, a friend that you want out of the friend zone. Um, you got the whiz kid in here. You got two whiz kids, one being the one that's passed along, William H. Macy, and the other one that's kind of coming up through the ranks yep. uh, with with the father involved in the, the latter of the two. Um, who else is in it? And then you have the game show host yep. uh, with his family, uh, which is the... Oof. You've got John C. Riley as the cop. And John C. Riley, who it's almost like it's kind of... I don't. It's not really his. Pers- it's no. I don't think it's anyone's. I think they just have like it's. Uh, they take. It's a vignette of stories. It's a very. It's a very even keeled. I would say amongst like the big cast of characters. Yes. Um. So you've got John C. Riley as the cop, and then you've also got the game show host's daughter, who he uh, goes and sees because of a of a disturbance call, and so they kind of mm-hmm. like con- make a connection and. That that connects to like all these different other elements going on, and it's weird. I don't know if I. I think they're all just kind of happening at the same time. Yes, you know, mm-hmm. or it's it's really just. Um, yeah, they're all happening at the same. It I, and we'll get into it because it, it really held true, and then and you know, um, some of the you know I had to do some digging after this one. So and then there was a really it was a fun kind of line at the end, and there's something that really stood out to me, and I was like, oh wow. So, anyways. Uh, I think that's it, and then we kind of—it's it's all these events that are really happening within a day. Yeah, I mean, I it, it, this thing happens like it. <laughs> this is a good like twenty-four hour period movie. Oh my god! Like, and it, it kind of feels like twenty-four hours because it's three hours long. <laughs> well, and seriously, like the first thirty minutes, I had to pause it like to go to the bathroom or something. I was like, holy shit, thirty minutes have gone by, and then all of a sudden, I'm like, I had to pause it again. I was making like getting some food or something like that, you know, and I'm like. Oh fuck! Like we're at a ninety minutes. Like God, I thought yeah. this was almost. And then all of a sudden, it's there's fifteen minutes left in this thing. Mm-hmm. Like it goes by quick. The pacing is is very. I think the pacing's intentional with what's happening in the with the characters as well. Well, it helps too that there's so much going on. Yes. Um. So what what do you want to start talking? I don't even about know. With this? Like, like, where I do you even begin to talk about a movie like this? I have no idea because there's so much jam packed into it. I guess I guess the first thing I guess we can answer is like, what was your favorite story? My favorite story, um, God, dude, honestly, I don't even think any one of them would have been really that redeemable. <laughs> um, what was yours? You go with yours because I'm gonna have okay. to try to think of. I think mine would probably have to be. See, Tom Cruise's I think is good, but you don't get a whole lot of it super often until towards the end. But I think I really like the the game show kid. Like, yeah, like when he's on the game show, like the young boy. Mm-hmm. I really, I was really fascinated with that storyline. Just like the tension of like him having to go pee and then like pissing his pants and then like making a statement on national television about how they're basically exploiting these kids yes uh i i fucking loved that storyline honestly that probably had to have the highest probably highest oh no i don't know they all were very tense yeah it it was a very like tense and i feel like there was a lot of moving parts to that one specifically because you've got the kid who's like on the verge of pissing his pants and he's got to like answer all these questions and he's got to live up to the expectations of his dad. Right. And you've also got his dad in the room watching him on TV, like screaming at it for his kid to like make up for those points that they lost. And then you've got the game show host who is going through like this, this cancer, this like medical condition that's like causing him to like stutter and slur on national television. That's also hammered. Yeah. And then you've also got like his sort of like group around him that are reacting to everything that's happening. And so it's like a very frantic feel. And you've also got like, well, and you know, what, adult I, contestants like trash talking the kid contestants, the, like I, that back and forth. The fun part about that one too was the vibrancy of the game show itself because it is a high pace kind of, yes. you know. <laughs> and you have the one, you have the kid that's not doing anything. Obviously, the other two kids are there for looks or whatever, or just mm. happen to get on with Stanley. Um, and then you got the 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 uh, host who, oh my god, cringeworthy like. Every time it's like, I don't know what's going to happen with this dude, yeah. you know? And then the whole time it's in front of this audience and people are cheering and hollering and hooting and it's like, you know, lights are, it's like you're at a carnival. Almost. It feels so disconnected from reality. Yeah. And I think that's the point that PTA wanted to get across is that like these game shows are just like that. Cause he, I guess he had experience working on a very similar show. Oh really? Yeah. Uh, it said 
when he was I looked at like the production of this film and I just read through like the Wikipedia and uh, he worked on this show uh, what's it called um, yeah I, it's taking me a little bit to find it let me see for sure well and that's where um, you know I was trying to do was it funny I thought it was funny that all the questions on there did you like I, I think they had to have designed it where they were like unanswerable, right? Like, did, right. did you listen to those questions and you were like, "Oh, I know that one." Uh, they were just, if I remember right, they were all very like, uh, like French artistes from like eighteen seventy five. I mean, it could have been. Questions. I mean, it really like, could have been like super specific things that like only people who had studied that stuff would know about. It was like I was laughing. I was like, I think he's really poking fun at game shows right now. Because like, <laughs> yeah, I, I was so. like, I don't think this this was happening in the nineties. Yeah. So uh, according to this, uh, before Anderson became a filmmaker, one of the jobs he had was an assistant for a television game show, Quiz Kid Challenge, an experience he incorporated into the script for Magnolia. Mm. So he's got like firsthand account of how those things go, and he's yeah. definitely like satirizing it to the point that it's letting people know, hey, this shit actually happens, and like oh, parents oh. are these much of assholes to their kids. Well, and you saw it with William H Macy's story. Mm-hmm. He, yeah. Oh my God, he might have had. <laughs> I think he had the funnest storyline for me. <laughs> uh, dude, the bar scene is so fucking cringeworthy. I know, but at the same token, it's so. It's elegant, I want to say. Mm-hmm. Just being so disconnected with what you had and where you're at um, and what you want, mm-hmm. you know, and how he is so out of touch with things. Yet he at one point had, he had it, you know, and yeah. you saw that he had all that. I mean, I've, you know, his parents did horrible, horrible things to him. He's got like recognizable fame, but it's not like that's helping him in any way. No. I mean, it, and he used to be smart. Now he can't. I mean, he's dumb. Uh-huh. You know, he used to. He probably used to be able to connect. Like, you know, what, the question is: Was he Stanley? Was he that version of Stanley, or was he the other fat kid? Right. You know, what one? What what personality did he serve? Because now you're talking to William H Macy, who had been struck by lightning, mm-hmm. and is working a sales job. And obviously, I mean, he's much like Evelyn. Things did not go his way. No. And they were a little bit out of his control for why they didn't go his way. Mm-hmm. You know, struck by lightning. Parents robbed him of all his money, and now he's just trying to get by on the on the lure of you know this is what I once had, and he can't even remember the, the shit that he did. I know it's 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 a tragic story. Yeah. Um. The 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 whole the whole scene with like him like t- before he goes to the bar where he's like at his place of work, <sighs> and he's like I need money I need money for for. Uh, dental corrective surgery and he's they're like what and he's like braces i'm getting braces and they're like your teeth aren't bad Did, and he's like oh no no i need them and then as soon as you go to the bar and you like see the bartender who's like ripped as shit yeah and like brad. this yeah brad <laughs> was that his actual name brad i think so oh I'm my pretty, god dude it was very cringe pta was ahead of his time man. i why what's for the brad is just kind of like this sort of i don't know kind of handsome like chad and sort of name oh yeah chad and they're Brad. very generic like yeah kind of like br- like handsome bro name right 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 uh-huh yeah uh, <laughs> no i i really like the um what do you call it juxtaposition between the other guy that was there mm-hmm. the other old guy that obviously what like exact opposite of him probably like what would have happened had he not been struck by lightning and had had that money yeah i was gonna say that's a good like inverse image yeah of what what he could have been like yeah i had things worked out yeah that's a good that's a good point point. and it was very fun to see those two kind of competing over brad mm-hmm. and it's like i don't know i thought it was very funny because you definitely have you know that that's why he was gonna get braces yeah and <laughs> And then he, because he goes into that bar and he's like, I, Pepsi, you know, like definitely not going to get smashed. Like he's just going to probably woo and then go home, mm-hmm. you know, like just, and then he sees that guy hitting on him and he hands him money, goes, give me a fifth of tequila. Mm-hmm. And that's when he's just like, I'm going to do it. I'm going to let him know. And yeah. then it like, it builds up to that point. Ah! <laughs> and he does it. And I was like, oh my God, like so bad. I know. My name is Donnie Smith. And I have a lot of love to give. Oh, he, dude, that is one of my favorite lines. But no and one to give it to. <laughs> I kept, I was yelling that after I'd seen it. I saw this film Monday night, so I think I was saying it. I was saying it to a couple people yesterday, mm. like in Jess. It was. It's a really good line, though. It's mem. I feel like I heard it somewhere before. It, yeah, I feel like I've heard this line or a very similar line used somewhere else. Yeah, 
And this has to be like the origin of it because hey, as soon as he said it, I'm like, that's an iconic line right there. Has to be. I'm gonna start quoting that in my daily life. Oh my god, dude! It was it that that was that was probably cringe like the least. Um, it was it was not so it was tense, but like the least. I'm trying to think attached to the tension because yeah. obviously with the Wiz kid, um, him not going up there, they're losing all that money. Mm-hmm. Cruz and his dad, obviously, this is a very like impactful moment in both their lives. Because I mean, if Cruz, if he doesn't go, he could be broken forever, never having had that chance. Yeah. Right. Uh-huh. And uh, I mean, big girl, who you know, who the fuck cares about him? Um, <laughs> and then the the uh, the game show host and his daughter. You know, even I mean, Tom C. Tom, John C. Riley, um, with a couple of his his things may have been like lower, but I don't think. It was those that was to serve the purpose of what he does at the end. Mm-hmm. I want to. F- so this had like the least amount attached to it, but one of the it was. So that's why I think maybe I liked it the most. Yeah. Because it there wasn't it didn't seem so severe. Because I mean like I people have been there like when you can't communicate how you feel towards someone mm-hmm. and you just don't know how to say it and it's like and then he gets smashed and says it which is probably like, then <laughs> yeah. So I, that's why I think I liked it the most and then. Um, you know, I mean, like, and then, and then towards the end of the film, is a little bit of a comeuppance, but redemption, and we'll yeah, get, so kind of like a little, a little, uh, little punishment, and then, you know, sort of comfort that he yeah. gets. Um, it, it definitely feels like the game show is like the center of everything, whereas like everything else just it's just kind of like a different branch, and like whatever size that branch is, it has to do with like the involvement of it or whatever. So like the William H Macy story is like a branch of. Mm-hmm. the game show story but then like it's a, like a decent sized branch because he used to be on that show right um but then you've got like the tom cruise story where like his branch in relation to the game show is pretty small because uh big girl production big girl productions exactly and so that's where that connection is and then <clears throat> of course you got like the big earl story with like philip seymour hoffman himself mm-hmm. I, I would say like that's a that's a like Maybe a little bit of a smaller branch. There's it's like a twig different, off the branch. Yeah, there's like all these different branches coming from like this game show, and you can it argue really, like that's you big, could, yeah. Big Girl <laughs> production was I felt was what the overlying. It was, I thought it was Big Girl because I'm like it, without, it was Big Girl. Like yeah. without him, it doesn't really. You don't have the quiz show. You don't have these stories, and that's why I honestly thought because um, the movie opens up with them talking about those things that happen, mm-hmm. um, which I don't remember the first the. Some some doctor got robbed and then they hung the guys. Yeah, the scuba diver one I thought was the most interesting. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then they have the guy that was going to commit suicide, but there's a safety net. But his parents ended up killing him, and yep. it was like all these stories are related. And then they said some guy profited off of these stories, and then it cuts into Big Earl in his deathbed, I believe. Yep. Like I think so. I thought I was like, oh, Big Earl caught this made money turned into big Earl productions and this is where we're at now yep you, so without big Earl, you don't have tom cruise being right. who he is you mm-hmm. don't have you don't have uh philip seymour hoffman being where he is you don't have william h macy being right the kind of character that he is uh, i think the only one that you could say would stem from it is john c Riley. Mm-hmm. like yeah. i think his that's why i kind of thought it was his perspective like it was kind of his story but you really you can't go off it. I think it's a series of vignettes with everyone hitting their own climax. Mm-hmm. Giggity. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, do you think you have like a least favorite story out of all of these? Oh, Julianne Moore. Okay, Julianne Moore. For I, I never connected with her. At, the the reason why this kind of dragged down was at one point there was kind of characters I started losing interest in because mm-hmm. um, I wasn't very sure of what was going on. And it like it's not very clear that this is like a vignette or their stories. I mean, like he leads off saying like all everything happens for a reason. There's no coincidences in this world. I'm about to show you another set of stories of why they're all connected. Yeah. And um, she, I thought it was his daughter. And then you find out that it's his, it's a lover yeah. and she doesn't want the money. And it's never really explained that it's just assumed that she just falls in love with big girl towards the end of it. Yeah. Like she had actually gotten to like fall in love with him and know him as a person and appreciate him. And then like feeling all this guilt for like going behind his back and cheating on him. Well, she married him for the money yep. and she knew that she could do what she did. Mm-hmm. And then she kind of hated herself for doing it. Yep. And it's like, okay, I get that. But like, there wasn't any point in which I'm like, 
oh, I definitely like they didn't they don't harness it. I mean, you kind of get that feel, but and maybe if it were clearer that it was a um if it were like a wife mm -hmm. instead of a daughter. Because I thought she was the daughter when she think, showed up. I think I, I got that she was the wife. Cause, you did? Uh, well, she like kisses him on the forehead, and then she says something along the lines of, like, uh, I'll be back, sweetie, or something like that. Could have. I mean, I, like I said, I could have missed it. I'm not, I'm not saying that. That's why my mm -hmm. perspective on it was a little. But, I mean, that's still, like, a valid point. Too. Distorted. I didn't. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm saying. I never. I didn't really catch on, to like, oh, like, you just flipped your brain because of nothing that's explained in this this guy's a giant piece of shit yeah like you find out like what he did <laughs> yeah you find out what he did and why tom cruise is the way he is yeah um i think i i liked her character and i liked her performance mm -hmm. of the character oh, yeah. enough to to say that that isn't my least favorite i would say i don't think i connected too much with the game show host himself and like his Good. whole story with like his well yeah especially once you find out what he does at the end good um but i was way more invested in the kid at the game show than i was like him being the host and like being sick and like slurring his words and stuff and it was a nice like touch to that whole situation mm -hmm. i think it did like definitely add to the scene but in of itself i don't think it was enough for me to say yeah, that was like a, a really good like story it's, line. Well, it's funny that you say that because the whole time um so he goes in there, daughter yells at him, he gets to get the fuck out. Yep. And it's never explained. Yeah, so that it's whole never time touched on. For me when I was easy with your words, dude. Oh uh, <laughs> redacted. Yeah. <laughs> Beep boop. <laughs> um so the whole time that that's going on, it's like, oh, this guy's dying. And obviously, like, he now they do show him fucking some prostitutes. Like, you know, he's not a good dude. Mm -hmm. um, but it's like, while that's going on, it's like, all right, well, what's his whole thing in this? Like, what are we going to learn about? So I guess the intrigue around his character and what he had done kept it going for me. Yeah. Whereas, like, yeah. So, I mean, and that's, I, I'm not going to lie. Uh, this is the most crying and screaming I've seen in one film. It's and, heavy. Like, this is a very emotionally heavy film. Yeah. Just yeah. in terms of like the characters and like the story itself. It is. A hundred percent. But it definitely felt more of like two nineties acting than it would like right now. Yeah. Like I think there'd be if it was redone now, there'd be a lot more subtle crying. Yeah. A lot more maybe rage instead of like screaming. I at, feel like if it was done now it'd be a lot more cynical than yeah than this movie is now mm -hmm. if, it, if they made this movie in 2022 i feel like there would be so much cynicism in it and you wouldn't get that sort of same like pure emotion true i mean and that's where i see that's where i have a heart I, I do i think it is i think the crying is dude tom cruise was fucking phenomenal okay yeah like yeah, let's talk about him for like, a bit. Uh, let's just face the fact he, he he carried this film and he was amazing he was great and i don't think he was like other than like towards the end when he does go to the house and and like confront Earl, like it, like I don't think he was in it too much. Like they would cut back and forth between his story, but you wouldn't spend too much time on it. And you would like see that progress during like the TV interview and like his his sort of transition from like oh this like super charismatic like confident guy Comment. who has like everything that he wants, and yeah. then like all of a sudden it goes and he turns into like a shell of himself. Like he's like slouched in the chair and he's like trying to like disappear and he doesn't say a single word. And he's got like this whole serious demeanor the entire time. He went from, yeah, he went from very like, I rule the world to, um, he did not like, but I think he was, there was, he just hadn't, he hadn't thought about it. I mean, if he, I think in this whole thing, he says like the past will break you. Yeah. Like you don't have, you'd never acknowledge the past. I think he was like ADHD. Mm hmm. And it, it plays into his character, like his body language at the very end of the film, very well as to where you're at at the beginning of the film with him. I was so impressed with his acting in this movie. He's got like, chops, man. That dude can act. The the way that his he was able to like move his face and like make these certain twitches, like when he was responding to like certain questions, I was like, Holy shit. Yeah. This is like if you're asking like a real person about real personal shit in their lives and tom cruise is nailing it yeah he has like his eyes would change a little bit like his facial expression would kind of change like he started like when he starts catching on to the question yeah like he would have like this little twitch like by his like cheek and like eye yeah that would happen at like certain tough questions that would be asked his way and i was 
I, I noticed it every time. I was, really, I was very impressed with it. Yeah, yeah. He uh, he was he 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 was he was fun. I mean, well, <laughs> he was fun, but I mean, what he was his his subject matter was not. I mean, that was it was insane. It was enthralling. But like, <laughs> he definitely like captures like you know the crowd. Yeah, like he he knows what he's doing. He's making good money doing it, and he probably loves doing it. I, I love the scene where it's right after the interview, and he's got to go back on stage. And you can tell that he's just shaken up. Like he's trying oh, yeah, his best 100. to like carry that charismatic energy that he had before, but you can tell that it's just not there. Oh, dude, you know that would happen to anyone. I mean, we've all been in that moment where it's like, all right, got to go back into character. Oh, by the way, and then they just drop the news on you, and it's like, okay, and then all of a sudden it's just empty. You yep. know, that you got nothing behind what you're. I mean, because it's all a ploy for him. I mean, but he has fun doing it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's for him to make money, and all of a sudden, like you can't get back into that character. He's just not himself. I mean, it broke him. It did. I think it's such a good dichotomy uh, of what he's saying on stage versus how he actually is. Because what he's saying on stage is like, all right, our next lesson is pretending to care, yeah, or pretending like you care, and uh, this whole, you know when you first meet Tom Cruise's character, you're like, oh, this guy's like the fakest person in the world. Mm -hmm. But then you see his confrontation with Big Earl and you realize, holy shit, this character actually does care. He does give a shit. He yeah, was there dude. for his mom the entire time and he had to take care of her after Big Earl left them when she was sick. Uh, and, and it really molded him into who he is. He's somebody who does care, but he just puts up this giant wall. Oh, that, and then it, it, that's what he's teaching you, how to... How to yeah, it's... It was fun. I thought it was going to be like the mom thing too. No, it was the dad and how you turned. I mean, there's yeah. a lot of like, uh, there's a lot of like sickness in this movie, like uh, some like cancer stuff going on. Like there's three different instances. There's Tom Cruise's mom, there's Big Earl, and there's the game show host. Yeah. And uh, I can't help but but think that that is definitely like a, a running theme going on in this movie. Um, uh, coinciding with like past regrets and because that's a, a lot of like what this movie is about too is just like oh. regretting what you did in the past and oh, like I, confronting it in a certain way i would and i think it's it's very generational too about how what happens to you know the actions that you have as a person older in life how it impacts those you know loved ones that are you know as they're coming along and you get to see some uh, a little bit of retribution and you know a little bit of i mean just that the ending, so... <laughs> so, uh, the the ending. So, Exodus 8-2. I yep. saw that sign being held up at the start of the game show. And and do you I, know, so, do you know Exodus 8-2? I or looked did it up you? while the movie was playing. Right. Uh, and I, I did recognize it uh, after I read what it was. But, right. Uh, you know, it, it read something along the lines of, and they shall be plagued by, by frogs, mm -hmm. uh, raining frogs or something along those lines. Right. And I'm like, why the fuck is this passage in the movie? That's weird. And then <laughs> I forgot about it, but I kept seeing it like pop up throughout the film. Yeah. Like Exodus eight too, like on like street signs and like people holding signs up. Marketing. All this different yeah. Stuff. It, yeah. Like it, it, I was like, I wonder what the fuck this means. And then all of a sudden, like, John C. Riley's driving down the road. And then, boom, boom. Like, two frogs just hit his windshield. And it's like, what the fuck is this? And then all of a sudden, he looks up, and there's, like, all these frogs just falling from the sky Dude. in this movie that was just super grounded in reality for, like, most of the time. Yeah. Like, I, I, was, I was very... Uh, <laughs> I, I think I had my hands up on my head. I'm glad that you didn't. So as I alluded to earlier, I had walked down towards the ending of Magnolia when my brother was watching it in high school. And I happened to walk down when John C. Riley's in that car. Uh huh. And like I sit down and like all of a sudden that first frog comes down and I was like, and then it just starts raining frogs. And I'm like, Sam, like, what are you watching? And that's what he told me. I, dude, I'd only seen two clips of this film ever uh -huh. in the entire. And I knew, I knew Tom Cruise was who he was. I think from like, you know, snippets on Netflix or whatever you gloss by. So I kind of had seen. Yeah. Two, two images. One, John C. Riley with the thing. The second one, William H. Macy getting it, hit in the head, falling down, hitting the ground, and breaking his face. Uh -huh. That's the only two things I'd ever seen in this film. And I thought, because I didn't know I walked in towards the end of it, I thought it was like 
a whole thing that was going to turn into Moses and the Ten Commandments and the plagues and whatnot. Yeah. I didn't realize there was 15 minutes left. You thought it might have been just like a horror film? <laughs> so I'm watching it this time, and I'm like, when the fuck do the frogs come in? <laughs> yeah. Like, I knew it was going to happen, and then you kind of, and then it happens, and like I was like, All right, well, what the fuck is, like, that's it? Yeah. You know? And so... <laughs> it is, it's very much treated as if it's like actual weather. It's funny, too. The rain like, comes and goes. <laughs> knowing that it was going to happen and had having not seen the film, knowing it was going to happen, not like real, like having in the back of my mind, when is this going to happen? And then having it happen, mm -hmm. I never went like out of the realm of what I'm anticipating, expecting from this film. It never, which is incredible, like to watch this and then not be put off at that point. Yeah. And I don't know if it's with the buy-in with the characters or the fact that every it's just you don't really know what's going on. You know, I mean, I think it helps too that the characters are are equally as surprised as the audience, because obviously, you know, well, it's raining fucking it's frogs, fucking raining frogs, and so they're just like, holy shit, it's raining frogs. And the kids like even sit in the library by himself, and he's like, this is something that happens. Yes, this is something that happens. He's just totally dumbstruck by it. Yeah. And so you get the sense of like, oh shit, these characters have to like uh, basically hide for their lives while these frogs are falling down, like take shelter with each other. But you you kind of think to yourself like, oh, I care about these characters' safety. I care about where these characters are in this situation. And so like you connect your feelings with the characters at the time with your fear, your feeling of the characters throughout the entire movie. Yeah. And I think it's an effective way of like making you like reaffirm to yourself like I feel a certain way about these these people. That's interesting. Yeah. I don't know if maybe a couple. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I never I don't yeah. Cuz I I definitely could see that. I think William H Macy, uh John C Riley. Yeah. Uh those two for sure just cuz they're in the shit. Mm -hmm. The mom driving, I really I was like, "All right, you know, everyone was indoors though." So I never really had that sense of dread. Yeah. I think it was like if you were outside, it's funny too, because like the dogs, I, I was like, are they out there or not? Yeah. So maybe it was <laughs> Philip Seymour Hoffman. I was a little worried about with his uh, I was with his say, companions. Yeah, he's he's the only one that like kind of gets a little shaken up from it. You know, he gets hit in the face and then he basically breaks his well, teeth. He's no, that was well, that was William H Macy. Oh, did you say John C Riley? No, Philip Seymour Hoffman oh. was the guy that I was like, he's like, he's only, I mean, he's the one that realized it. he's like, it's fucking raining frogs. Like, <laughs> yeah, what yeah. the fuck is going on here? Do you like the the foreshadowing too with everybody saying it's rain cats and dogs? Oh in yeah, the movie? <laughs> yeah. Well, it's funny. I don't know, and I'm I'm probably the only one that says it, but I like to tell people it's raining rats and frogs. Oh yeah, yeah. I think I do it kind of from having seen this, and then it, you know the plague. So it, yeah, it's yeah. kind of like it's tongue in cheek. Plague you know? of frogs, plague of rats. Yeah, it's <laughs> yeah. Like well, it's raining, and then everyone's got it's raining cats and dogs. How biblical of you, much like PTA in this film. Well, and I it's. It's interesting. So the movie ends for me, and my my takeaway was, and I was like, I, I was just like, I guess maybe it's like the human spirit mm -hmm. carrying on. But this is, and this was before I started reading a little uh, uh, up on it, because um, I, I was like, I don't know what else you can take away from this. You know, it's just kind of like it's a really n not nice, but it's an in depth look at the lives of others. Yeah, and that everyone, no matter where you're at in life there's always shit going on and there's always something that's going to be bugging you and then for you know and and so the message of the film at the beginning is things happen for a reason you know mm -hmm. and then it's kind of at then like no anything can happen to happen like you just need to accept it and roll with the punches yeah you know i read a comment online about this film that said uh the movie's pretty much about even though even though it's raining hard right now it will eventually stop. Yeah. And I think that is definitely a, a, a poignant uh, a comment to make for this movie. I think it's one that resonates with me. Yours, yeah, mine was, um, and it was actually funny, the one that, that stuck with me is at the beginning of the film, the narrator says, you know, these things happen. I And I might be misinterpreting it because I don't remember what the kid said, but the narrator says that these events are correlated and happen for a reason. There's no coincidence. Mm -hmm. And then the kid kind of says, as it's raining out, he's like, you know, or it's without reason. And so the kid's like, well, I mean, these things happen. Like it, it can rain frogs. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of like the, 
you know, and that's where I kind of, I, I didn't pick up on it until after I kind of read that and thought about the film. I was like, oh, the whole time we're kind of guessing as that all these stories are related, but I mean, really it's, are they? Yeah, they're related, but they're very much their own stories. That's what I'm saying. Like, yeah, it's it, not like one ever like really interrupts the other. It Big Earl did bring. I mean, Big Earl kind of has all without him. None of these happen. Mm-hmm. So, but outside of that, none of them impact what's going on anywhere else. Yeah, the kid never. It's not like he did anything to impact John C. Riley finding his gun, right? You know, or John C. Riley helping with the daughter never mended the relationship with her dad. Mm-hmm. So that's why I was kind of like, it's kind of funny. I mean, it's a little bit of, a, it's a little bit irony. Yeah. You know, because I mean, without Big Earl, yeah, none of these things are taking place. But at the same token, none of, none of what's happening is impacting the other. Yeah. You kind of like, when you were watching this movie, it's so long. And the whole time you're kind of thinking to yourself, how are these movies, how are these stories going to like converge onto each other? Yeah. Like, yeah. how are they all going to like connect and like coalesce to a conclusion? Mm-hmm. And really, like, each individual story gets, it, gets its own climax. Yeah. And uh, for the most part, I think each of those stories is pretty satisfying uh, so, for the most part. No, oh, I'd agree. I mean, like, the nice thing, I, one of the nice things is uh, John C. Riley. Mm-hmm. Uh, he wanted to be the cop. He didn't want to be a judge, jury, executioner. He wanted to be. He you wanted know? to be like just an honest police officer. I really liked him in this movie, and I'm not a huge John C. Riley fan. He's got chops too, man. I uh, yeah, like I I, I think the comedies kind of did him dirty. Yeah, well that, and I think that this is the movie that I like him in the most because I in terms of like a dramatic role. Yeah, because I've seen Gangs of New York. I wasn't a huge fan of him in that. Uh, I've seen. We need to talk about Kevin. Oh, you have? Yeah. Oh. I, I felt like he was probably like one of my lesser favorite parts of that movie. Oh, there's only really two that you're... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> we, we need to talk about Ezra. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, just in terms of like him and his like acting and like playing this character, I really liked him. I did too. I thought he's phenomenal. And I, I was pleasantly surprised that I liked him because normally I'm, I'm not a huge fan of him. What's funny about it too is that I did not buy in that he was the laughing stock of the station. I, you kind of get that sense uh-huh. when he finds the body at the beginning, and he's not the one talking to the reporter. He's not the one talking to. He got bumped from the lead. On and it. he's like, yeah, he's he's like in the circle of other cops discussing what's happened, and he's like getting cut off. Like yes. while he tries to like chime in with something important. Yeah. And uh, that's, I think that was like a little bit of a, they, and they didn't have to beat you over the head with it. So I mm-hmm. guess it was kind of like you take it away, but it's not like, I don't know, because at past that it's the relationship with the daughter. So you never really get, you get the sense that it's, it's built up that they kind of view him like this, but it's not. Yeah. Well, and it's very much like from his perspective too. So yeah. what he views and like what is actually taking place could also, you know, be a disparity. Right, right, and if, yeah, um, which I, I really enjoy that you know you get his perspective on it and not really anybody else's. Um, yeah, the, this movie is so so jam packed. Uh, was there anything else that you? Well, did you have like any criticisms of this? Oh, just uh, I mean, my biggest thing was probably um, uh, the the screaming and the crying. <laughs> I just saw it, it is heavy handed. I just thought it was way too. I think it, it was a little overacted by certain parties, but I also think that it was a little tough. Like Julianne Moore, I think overacted in this. Okay. Like I definitely get that, the, uh, that sense, uh, the daughter, the coked out daughter. Now I don't know anyone that's like that. So she might've nailed it. Definitely did not give me, it felt like, I'm going to watch someone do coke one time and emulate that. Yeah. It didn't, like, I don't know. And I don't know how, but I did not ever feel like, oh, I mean, like, I know she's, like, drug-induced, but I, this feels like someone that's faking, like, a drug-induced, you know. Mm -hmm. Feels very much like a performance. Yes. Um, Yeah, I didn't feel that necessarily with the daughter, but, yeah, Julianne Moore, I did kind of get that sense, especially in the pharmacy scene. Oh, my God. When she's yelling at them. Just screaming for no, I mean, and I get you feel judgment, but, like. Yeah, I, I, I was watching that scene, and I'm like, I like her acting in this, and I'm in, intrigued by it, but I also had that thought in the back of my head, too. I was like, okay, this is definitely a performance yeah. that's happening. And she it did took that. me out a little bit. Well, when she did that, and then she got to the lawyer, I was like, what are we doing here? Yeah. Uh, 
Yeah, her her performance felt a little too theatrical yes. at points. Um, I really like Philip Seymour Hoffman in this. I like the fact that he played like sort of this like really caring, um, like just almost desperate guy who's like trying to connect this father and son. Yeah, well, and he. <laughs> so watching it, it was really I liked. I kind of liked it. I I liked when we went back with him, and mm. I just had a hard time of gauging where he was at. And I think it was just he was being very wholesome, um, because. He's sitting with Big Earl. Big Earl's calling him a cocksucker and all this and that, right? And mm-hmm. he's like, all right. He's you just know, rolling Earl. with the punches, yeah. yeah and you, and that, that, at that point, you're like, all right, this dude likes his job, and he knows that people are dying. He's just there to, hey, get it off your chest, man. And then he starts flipping through the channels, right? And he's kind of got, and it's like, all right, is he taking advantage of Big Earl? Like, this dude's dying. Is he going to, like, start? And then uh, then he's flipping through channels, and he stops on one. He's watching, like, this chick getting banged, you know? And he's sitting there, and he's, like, drooling over it for a couple of seconds. He's like, uh, and then he starts flipping it. And then he makes, like, that connection, like, maybe I'll make this phone call. Like, mm-hmm. or maybe Big Earl called him in afterwards after he'd watch that. I don't remember because he gets on the phone to order some stuff. Yeah. And he orders a Playboy, a Hustler, and something else. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, dude, this is going to turn into sexual deviancy. All these people in here are fucking, cr- like, you know, horrible, horrible people that yeah. all have a di- like sickness of something. Like we're about to find out his. Uh-huh. And then he just goes in there and he's like, "I gotta get time." And that's the only way you could think of to get the number: seduce and destroy. Yeah, yeah. Through fucking <laughs> hustle or Playboy. So like, <laughs> I'm like, "Oh, what a fucking perv!" Like he's gonna go on here and just start jerking it. And then yeah. like he gets his stuff and he starts flipping through it, rifling through it. And then he finds the number and he just pulls out the phone. And he calls. And I'm like, "Oh, I'm like he really cares." Yeah, yeah. I love that subversion of expectations. Yeah. Because I had that same thought. I was like, oh, God, this guy's a scumbag. You have to, right? Like, And then and then everything that happens, happens. And you're like, holy shit, this guy's just like a genuine dude. Like, he really just wanted, all right, like, he's going to go where he's going to pass. Like, we got to get these two connected. Like, I have to do it. Like, this is my life's missing right now. Mm. That scene where he's talking to the guy on the phone, he's like, you know that scene in the movie where the guy tries to connect the father and lost son? Well, this is that scene. This is that scene in that movie. I'm watching. That was honestly, that was probably my favorite performance from in this dirty film. Philip Seymour. Oh, in the film, yeah, from from this movie, and probably like from him. He's too, really honestly. just fucking good, dude. Yeah, I really liked him in this in this movie, and I I feel like I've seen clips of him in that scene before of like a best acting, you know, oh, montage it might have whatever been like his yeah yeah in like memoriam. his like talent reel. Um, but that was really compelling. I really like just the emotion in his face and like his voice. Like you could tell that he was like he himself was on the verge of crying. Oh, him uh, <laughs> in that scene. See, that's where I'm like, I don't know. I and I don't. You're just with the character so short of a time for it to be. Cruise, I get like mm-hmm. that one was like very like man. Um, Julianne Moore, I did not care about. Philip Seymour Hoffman, when he started, well, I'm like. I get that you really care about this, but there's no way that you're, you've, unless for some reason, but it wasn't explained or shown to the audience members, which you can't, that he should be crying. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like, I just took it that he was just a very emotional dude. For sure. But mm-hmm. I mean, like, and I get that, but like at the same token, I'm like, you gotta, you gotta give me a reason for why you're going to shed those tears. And it can't be, I've been on the screen with you for all of 25 minutes, you and Big Earl, and he's called you a cocksucker, and I just know you like your job, and you're getting them connected. Mm. But past that, Cruz wasn't there. He was just tearing up at one point when he knows, like, oh, this is it. Like, he's dying. And mm. it's like, I know that you, you care for the dude, but to, like, sit there and bawl your eyes out over, I mean, like, technically the dude's a client. Like, yeah, I don't know. I, so, I didn't find it too unbelievable. It's not, it wasn't, no, I'm just saying from my perspective. Mm-hmm. That's what I'm saying. Like, it's not. I don't think, I think you could show this and probably, you know, a lot of people would be like, it's well warranted. I just didn't buy it because emotionally I didn't get um, as connected or I don't think it was justified, the relationship for him to do that. Mm-hmm. Now, when Cruz shows up and he did nail it and yeah. he's watching them and that it's turning into too. like a fucking like, oh shit, this is it. And mm-hmm. then the frogs, and then it's just like, huh. And they get to that. I was like, all right, like for sure. I think anyone that's like just went through that roller coaster of a ride mm. would probably be like, fuck, I got this and it happened and it worked. Like it would just, yeah, your heart probably melts. Like it, you know. But but the one before, that's why I just thought there was so much crying and screaming in this film. <laughs> well, like, yeah. It was so off putting to me. I was like, 
I don't think it, it just it felt theatrical at times. Yeah, there, it it definitely did for sure. And but. I think that's probably my biggest gripe because that that would take me out of the film. It mm-hmm. was like when those moments would happen. Like you're going, you're halfway through the film with the Julianne Moore pharmacy scene, and that happens. Like, oh yeah, I guess I am watching a movie. Mm-hmm. Oh, what time is it at? Yeah, you know, and that it didn't happen all that often. But the moments it did, it was just kind of like those were my timestamps. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, I totally understand that for sure. And I definitely feel that sort of same sentiment with certain scenes too. Like the Julianne Moore pharmacy scene or um, uh, a few other scenes here or there. Maybe like a little William H. Macy stuff, like when he's in the bar drunk screaming. But uh, I don't know. That didn't take me out too much. No, that one did. But that one, he's drunk. Mm -hmm. Then he's like, see, that's the one that was like kind of laughing at the most because you knew what was coming because you've had it like. You know, people have been there before where it's like, oh, man, the pretty girl's going to be at the party. I need to get a little bit of confidence. Yeah. And you just keep drinking to help that, you know, and you get to that point where, like, I'm going to do it. And then at that point, it's too far gone, you know, and you just, like, it just never was able to happen. So, I mean, you know, I mean, probably honestly, like, connecting to that moment with him, like, oh, shit, like, that does happen. So that, would, to me, was warranted because, I mean, people do do that where you just get to that point and all of a sudden it's like, it's just going to come out. I'm going to tell you. And that's why you get all the jokes about, like, what did you text last night or who did you call? Because people get on the phone, they'll get on the phone with their exes. They'll get on the phone with whoever. You know, you got the girl's number. Mm-hmm. Have you ever seen uh, Swingers? No. So, but I digress. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, he's the one that actually – and I think if – that has happened to you you probably could have like have seen that kind of coming you know mm. but um yeah no i don't mean to no no you're good you know i was just kind of like pretty unrelated i guess yeah sort of um the the scene where the dad drops the kid off to school yeah I didn't, the first time yeah um the next scene after that is william h macy driving in his car to work for for a probably solid five minutes, I thought William H Macy was the kid's dad. I thought to myself, "Oh, <laughs> this is where he like had to go into a hurry for, for work or whatever." But uh, nope, different characters. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, <laughs> that would be kind of funny. I was like, "Oh, no wonder he <laughs> like fucking grooming himself again." Oh uh, yeah, yeah, that was. Yeah, uh, it wasn't until a little bit later that I got a closer look at the dad character. I was like, oh, that's not William H. Macy. <laughs> no, I, I think I knew, because I, I know William H. Macy's got, like, a distinct kind of voice or, you know, yeah. vibe. So, like, I I did not. It wasn't. I thought it was actually going to be, like, a look in the past. Oh, Because I didn't yeah. know where the stories were at. Okay. So, so you thought I might have been doing, like, a little time jumping thing? Yeah, because I didn't. I'm. You got to remember, the only thing I know about this film is that it rains frogs. <laughs> yeah. And I don't know at what point that happens. Right. So anything in this thing is possible, like, going on. Mm-hmm. You know, I really had no... I thought it was going to be about the Ten Commandments. I was trying to, like, figure that out. Yeah, I was going to say, how, when, what time did you think that the frogs would appear? Like, when I were you know. expecting frogs? <laughs> um, Honestly, I, I kind of, like, once you get, like, halfway through it, you're like, oh, this is, they're going to pop up maybe. And I thought it would have been, like, frogs end of the film, like, raining frogs and it ends that oh, way. Yeah. You know, because that's kind of like when I, I was like, all right, Sam, this is a weird movie and got up and walked out. Mm-hmm. So I didn't know how much time was left either. So, I mean, when it didn't happen right away, because it was raining out the whole time, um, and I knew it was at night. Mm. It was kind of like I was starting, I, I picking up like, oh, this is because I don't think you really know that this is gonna be a twenty-four hour. It's not like it's proposed like this is events in a day. Yeah, yeah. You know, you're just kind of living the day with these people, and then you. That's when you pick up like, oh, this is gonna, you know, mm-hmm. this is what we're doing today. And that's when I was like, all right, it's gonna, you know, probably happen towards the end. And then it, you know, it's, I was hoping it would make sense, and it didn't. Mm-hmm. So, what did you think of the uh, the singing scene? When the song's going on and they're all singing at the same time. Bad. <laughs> Bad. Yeah, at least that was another one. That was probably another like um, critique I, that I had. I thought to myself, this is a very like 90s, early 2000s thing that I don't think you could get away with anymore. I think he was going with a different style. Um, just because he had the, if this were the scene in the movie mm-hmm. gimmick. I thought he pulled, was pulling a couple of gimmicks that you might not have seen, though, because it was we ha, we are going through this kind of warp timeline with the characters. Mm. So to have them all singing at the same time wasn't like that unrealistic. 
I just didn't like the song that they were singing, and I didn't really care that they were singing it. Yeah. You know, they even got Cruz singing it, and I was like. Yeah, I was. Uh, Cruz singing the song was a little, like, weird, right? Keep to the characters. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I know that we're breaking them down a little bit, but, like, still, like, I don't. I didn't. I wouldn't buy that he'd be singing that song. Yeah, and to himself in the car while he's, like, looking at his dad's house waiting to go inside. Mm -hmm. that Yeah, that kind of took me out of it a little bit. Yeah. Just, like, some characters I know would, like, not be, like, Cocaine Girl. Would she really be sitting there singing that song to herself? <laughs> that's uh, that's what I was kind of, yeah, agreeing. <laughs> there was, a, even though the kid, like, I think the kid was singing it at one point. Oh, yeah. Uh-huh. Like, I don't know if it was every character that had been tortured or affected by these people that were sick above them, but, like, um. <sighs> Yeah, I don't like. Well, there's a. Have you ever seen Scary Movie Two? I've seen Scary Movie Three. That's the only scary movie I've seen. Mm. Well, I'm sure you've seen more scary movies. Oh, mm. <laughs> um, no. There's a point in it where she's like driving the car and she starts singing, mm-hmm. and the radio singing. So they're both singing, and then, then the radio turns on. And she's like, "Stop singing my fucking song, bitch!" And I was like, "I wonder if they took that as like a satirical from Magnolia." Oh, <laughs> you know, because <laughs> maybe I was like, I've never seen. A movie where the characters were singing the song with the song being played. Yeah. You know? That's such a, like, this movie type of thing. Like, I've never seen that before in another film either. Yeah, that's why I was, like, when it was happening, I was like, oh, I guess, like, PTA's kind of going for a couple, like, uh, creative uh, choices with the direction. Because, I mean, all the shots were beautifully done. Cinematography was fantastic. Mm -hmm. He took a couple, I mean, he pulled a couple punches with, like, if this were the scene in the movie. Um, I mean, it fucking rains frogs. (laughs) And then, you know, he gets into... uh, uh, that that part and I was like oh I mean at this point like I've whatever happens happens I guess yeah. I'm not really I'm not it's not beyond belief for me right now mm-hmm. I mean obviously in this universe these things this is what's going on yeah uh yeah definitely one of the weaker parts of the movie for me too mm-hmm. um how about all the adultery going on too yeah like I thought there that's where I was kind of like in my head like Moses popping back up or something with the plague or the commandments like. Mm-hmm. A lot of adultery. A lot of adultery with like Julianne Moore and like the game show host, like just all that going on. The it's cocaine girl. Well, co- I guess it wouldn't be an adultery, but Big Earl. Yeah, I was and then say I'm Big pretty Earl. sure like you find out like Big Earl's wife was cheating on Big Earl at one point. Mm-hmm. Like I'm pretty not not Julianne Moore, but his like cancer wife. Oh yeah. Like I think like Tom Cruise said something along those lines, or the game show host's wife. I don't know if she ever came out and was like I was fucking around on you. Like there's just a lot of adultery in this film. Yeah. And a lot of it all like coming up at once too. Like I'm pretty yeah. sure the scene before the game show host confesses to his wife that he cheated. Like, I think big Earl was saying something about how he fucked around a lot. Yeah. He did. He was telling it to uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman. He's like, I had this beautiful wife and I fucked around and I fucked up. Mm-hmm. And yep. then all of a sudden he gets in there and he's saying, he's like, listen, darling, I have something to tell you. I've had sex with multiple women. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Several different times, several different times. Yeah. And the wife was like, okay, but there's also this, yeah. which is the reveal that he like molested their daughter. Yeah, the cocaine girl. Like that. What that? That's the, that was the biggest turn in the movie for me. Mm-hmm. So then you understand why she was screaming at him at the beginning. Yes, like just disgusted with him. <laughs> it's funny too because you know when he is like I don't remember like when he says that. That I, you, I think he was lying. Of course he was lying. He was like, so dude, lying. Dude, it's one of those. It's a rule. It's okay? one of those things where he said, "If I if I say yes, will you stay or like whatever?" He he knew he knew he was caught. It's uh-huh. if it's if it's may if you if it's no it's yes and if it's yes it's maybe or something like you know it's He's, like one of those yeah. things he was trying to his best to like. And he still couldn't live up to what he did too, mm-hmm. which I thought was crazy. I was like, man, I thought we were gonna get a little bit of a. Nope. Nope. Uh, yeah. So, a question, because I was a little bit confused as to what happened. Yeah. So, his scene at the end, he's got the gun, and he's about to shoot himself. Mm-hmm. And the frog falls through the skylight and hits his hand. The gun goes off, misses his head, and it right. hits like the. It hits like some TV. Yeah, it hits. It was a TV, and it it was a game show that was on. There was some sort of a production on. Yeah, but then like some because of it, something catches fire. The outlet. Yeah, because it's raining or something like that. And he's just like laying there. Yeah. Is it implied that he like burned? Yeah. With his house. Yeah. Because I I don't think think they showed any like aftermath. They don't. There's from what I from the other little bit I've read is there's some cut scenes that. Oh really? Yeah. 
there was that i think that one may have been cut where there was a takeaway with the house you see smoke coming out of the house oh okay so that was like a cut scene um the the uh inner city kid Mm -hmm. when he finds the gun um big worm was supposed to be in the film which is funny too because i thought when he goes, man, I told you the answer. It's right there. I was like, oh, it's Worm. And they were asking about Worm, but they never really show Worm. Mm-hmm. Um, worm was actually supposed to have a scene or scenes in the film to kind of show that relationship. Okay. And you know, at the end when Riley, the gun falls, mm-hmm. it was supposed to be Big Worm um, seeing who was it. They, were, they they robbed the money. He gets the money, and then he sees the daughter, like the cocaine daughter. or William, so He sees someone, and they both realize, like the kid and Worm both see him and go, they need this more than we do. Mm. So he helps out, gives them the money, and then as they kind of both connect and say, all right, like I've been a terrible father. Like You're my child. I need to do a better job raising you. So he takes a gun and throws it out the window, and mm. that's when Philip Seymour Hoffman gets it. Okay. In the movie, it just falls out of the sky. You mean John C. Riley? Yes, John C. Riley. <laughs> I made the uh, same mistake earlier. Yeah. It's all right. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so that's the, that was kind of cut up. Yeah, it's implied that he gets his comeuppance, and it's not necessarily suicide, but getting burned alive. Uh, yeah, that's kind of what I got from it. I just wasn't 100%. <laughs> it's funny, too, because it's like, oh, man, that's sweet. Oh, man, that's sweet. Like, well, maybe not sweet, but at least it's kind of like, it's mm. a little heartwarming. A little bit of justice. Well, it was definitely heartwarming for him. No, well, not no. I'm not talking about hurt. his character. I'm just saying, like <laughs> all the stories surrounded by it. Uh-huh. Like it's very um, humanistic. Mm. You know, with everything that kind of happens, there isn't this over congratulatory or bop you over the head. They all feel a lot better about themselves and are doing really well right now. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's just kind of like say la vie. You know, like it's life goes on, and uh, except his. Yeah, and it's funny because it's like all these stories are happening, and I was like, "All right, like here we go, here we go." And then it's just like you look over there, and the house is burning. And you're like, "I guess he probably did deserve it." Uh, <laughs> like, <laughs> I was kind of hoping, like, and I you don't know what happened, so I can't because they bop you over the head way late. I was hoping that there'd be like this some sort of like I don't know reparation or something with the daughter, like where he you know, and it's like you know, like I'm really sorry, but I and you know, like this is it. Mm-hmm. And, and it probably doesn't deserve it, but like, yeah, it, his was not yeah. well received. No, no, yeah, uh, just <laughs> yeah, like that's what you get, you fuck. Yeah, yeah, fucking scumbag. Yeah, little little piece of shit. Um, yeah, that was kind of it's weird how and I was it it's a the uh, <laughs> uh, um. <laughs> It's a point that I made earlier too, with how if this movie was made today, it would be much more cynical he, yeah. than it is now since it was made in 1999. Because it's like each character kind of like gets what they deserve in a way. Like the the kid stands up to his dad, yep. says you need to be a lot nicer to me, so he kind of grows into his own. Yep. John C. Riley and the cocaine girl enter like that relationship that they both need to find. Um, he he yeah he can care for her and he can she, he can be a trusting male figure mm-hmm. and she doesn't have to be you know yeah afraid tom, of failing him tom cruise kind of comes to terms with himself and like his relationship with his dad and yeah it just kind of all like falls together in a in a store of, sort of like storybook way almost see that's where <laughs> i Kind of and kind of not. I mean, so the storybook way definitely would have been like, and their lives went on happily ever after, or they kind of show you 20 years from now. This is right. where they're at. This was just like, you don't know if Tom Cruise goes back to seduce and destroy. <laughs> like, you, he very, that's his livelihood. Mm-hmm. And just because, I mean, he, you know, he, 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 got it, he got it out with his dad, maybe he does it in a healthier manner now. Mm-hmm. You don't know if John C. Riley and the girl make it. Right. You know, you don't know. But the only thing you do know is that guy goes up in flames. But even then, it's like left in, you know, maybe the rain keeps that fire from going on. Right. You know, so I think there was a lot of, it was kind of like this, like these moments happen in life and it, you've been put on this trail again. Yeah. Here's, here's the path back to where you needed to get reset to. But it doesn't, from everything that we've seen, it doesn't mean that these characters are going to make those right choices. Right. But I think for me, the storybook element is just like where it does end. Like the characters that uh, have a happy ending are the characters that deserve so, that sort of happy ending. Tom Cruise gets his kind of he a little bit of a happy ending because it's still like he's still got to deal with the he past. Get, yeah, he well he gets like a sense of closure. Yeah, mm-hmm. right. So, but he's walking in to see if Julianne Moore is dying. 
Right. Uh, the kid at eight years old, and it's kind of inferred that the dad said, all right, like, I go back to bed. Like, yeah. Not like, I'm going to treat you like shit anymore, but, like, that's, yeah, I don't know. I, I really I really like the way it ended. I guess I want, see, I just don't think it's storybook, but in terms of what we did view, it probably is. Mm-hmm. Um, I thought it was very open-ended, and it just, it, it ended on a very uh, much happier note than where we had started. Yes. <laughs> like, I will say that. Because that's kind of what this movie is about, is just like the ups and downs. Of life. Of life. Yeah. And, and like where it where it where it ultimately does end up and like how you keep going through it. Kind of like how you respond to the things that happen, too. Mm-hmm. For sure. Um, was there anything else you wanted to say about this movie? Uh, I don't think so, man. I, I don't think so. I don't really know. I, I'm... Yeah, <laughs> where we're satisfied with uh, everything. I really wasn't when it get when it ended. <laughs> yeah. I, I was like, "This is." And then I I I read a couple. <laughs> the, so, dude, you, okay. So I start. I was like, "I'm gonna read. A, I'm gonna do a little bit more digging on this. I want to kind of have like it can't just be about the human spirit, uh-huh. you know? Like it's there's got to be more message in here, right? The very first thing I read. <laughs> Fucking piece of shit. I wish I could find this article too. This guy sucked nine minutes out of my life. Oh, jeez. Uh, no, it was just like I'm gonna tell you some stories, mm. and then they go. He goes. He he breaks up every kind of vignette into its own story, mm. right? And it's like, and how they all kind of coincide. So he goes. He breaks them all down. I read everything I had just fucking watched on paper. Mm. R- read it. Yeah. Now what did PTA mean? That much. In an interview with Paul Thomas Anderson, he looked at the camera and said, "It really doesn't matter." <laughs> uh, all of these things happen, and just like the frogs, it just kind of happens, and it doesn't. Nothing really connects. There you have it from PTA's word or mouth, like, and that was it. That was the article. Didn't explain anything. No, nothing, and like, literally gave me something I could have fucking watched on the DVD commentary. Yeah, yeah, you gained nothing I, from that, dude. I was down. Like, I read nine minutes of this shit because all of those stories were typed out. Yeah, and I was like. It's going to connect somehow. You basically read a Wikipedia summary. <laughs> and I could have got to the end and just read that. Uh-huh. And then so I got to the next guy. And then, you know, thank Christ, the next two articles I read were like, you know, a little bit more in depth about their own thoughts and perspectives on it. So, uh, yeah, yeah, that was I think that was actually. And so after having read that, there's they said one of the guys like there's a subtle happiness that kind of, you know, coincides or takes over after you have like at least when I got done watching it. And I was like. And I kind of was sitting there. And I started thinking. I was like, you know what? Yeah, mm-hmm. I guess I like I am a little happy. Like I, like a lot of the things. It wasn't like overly blown. I mean, it wasn't like uh, everything everywhere all at once mm. in the sense of that closure. You know how that story wraps up, but um, it didn't need to be. Yeah, it, it definitely did what it needed to do. Yeah. Um, what would you rate it? I don't know. I think this is like it's either an it's an it's an eight or a nine. Okay. It's a very. Um, I I mean I I probably would be able to watch this film again too, mm. you know, and that says a lot for how heavy it is. Yeah, I would say I I I would give this a nine out of ten. I mm-hmm. would say it's closer to an eight. Yeah. Um, just because I do think it has a little bit uh more wrong with it than everything everywhere all at once. Yeah. It's um, you know, there's a little bit more about it that I didn't enjoy, but overall, I really like this movie. I think I liked it more than the master. Um, out of like the three PT, well, four PTA movies that I've Whoa, seen. Oh, you're up to four. I know. We it's might crazy. be tied. No, I think I got more than that. I, I yeah, sure you have more than that. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I would say that this is probably third of like the four PT or second out of the four PTA movies that I've seen. One being there will be blood. That one's gonna be hard to know. Boogie Nights is actually I can't. Boogie Nights might be next on the list. Next on the list. Well, it could be that or Heart Eight. I really want to watch Heart Eight again. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Awesome. Um, so we got one more bit of business before we, we end it out. Okay. Uh, and that is the film pick. Ooh. I get to make a film pick, McLean, and. Uh, this is one that I've kind of like had my mind on for a while. Okay. It was one that you mentioned uh, last episode. Really? Have Yeah. Like wanting to see again. And really? It's, it's one of my favorite films. What so were we talking about? I figured, uh, I figured we'll give it a what shot. What movie were we talking about when we had said we wanted to... I think, you were, I think we were talking about Dune. Dune. Mm-hmm. We were talking about Dune. Yep. 
And I said that I wanted to rewatch. You said you wanted to rewatch Blade Runner 2049. Oh, hot dog. So Denis Villeneuve is one of my favorite directors. And his favorite, my favorite movie of his is Blade Runner 2049. Is it? Yes. How do you know that? Uh, (laughs) (laughs) I just stumble. I can't defend myself. <laughs> uh, I got gotcha, you. I got gotcha. you. Um, yeah, I really want to watch this again and talk about it because uh, there's so much to it. And I'm interested in actually sitting down and, and kind of getting out a pen and paper and, and seeing if I can keep up. Yeah, I think I'll do the same thing. I'll, I'll get some notes down. We'll go over what we saw, what mm-hmm. we thought, and uh, I think it'll be a good time. Sweet. I fucking love that movie. Uh, I think I've seen it like three times. Um, Interesting. Maybe so we're getting four. That, we're getting it out onto the pod now, out of the airwaves. Mm-hmm. We want to see what you people think. Yeah. Is Kyle right about that being his favorite Dennis Villeneuve film? V- Dennis Villeneuve? <laughs> <laughs> I love hearing people trying to pronounce his name. It's what? Really funny. Should we do... Um, so I think... So, I I think we've I've seen... Should we watch both Blade Runner and Blade Runner 2049? Uh, we can. They're both on Netflix. That's what I'm thinking. I mean, um, I can carve out some time, and then I know I want to see The Northmen. Yeah. Um, so we can do those three movies. Yeah. That'd be sweet, actually. Um, if anyone's listening to this, too, and you want to go see The Northmen, uh, shoot Kyle a text or hit the Facebook up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll probably go again. Let's go together. <laughs> well, I'm saying, like, oh, I was going to say, if you're going to go, I mean, if other people want to go, because I know, I think... Uh, I want to ask Justin and see if Justin wants to go. I was kind of talking to him about it. So yeah, let me know when you go see it because I'll go see it again with you. Yeah, well, it's like the Batman. We, we went and saw that toy. So yeah. I'm excited. I really want to see this film. Like mm. it's gonna. We did talk about seeing it again. So I think both those, and then we throw a little Blade Runner because we could probably talk about both at the same time. Yeah, and how they're. I see. I had. I'm not trying to take this away from you. I no, had you're seen. Good. Have you seen Blade Runner? The yeah. original? Yeah, I've seen it. Okay, so I mean, like, I had not... It's been a while since I had seen it, and then I watched 2049, and then two years later, I was like, I wonder if Blade Runner is close to 2049 or how they relate. I don't remember all three of those, or both those films, all three viewing times. Mm-hmm. And I don't think it says anything about that. It's me, like, not, like, kind of keeping up with what's going on, and I think when I watched Blade Runner, this, the first time I had seen it, I was, like, 12. Oh, yeah. My, You're not going to get much from that. My that dad age. was like, this is a kick-ass, you know, action film. Yeah, that's a that's a certain expectation. To set. There you go. Like so, like that's why. And like so, then I say twenty forty nine, and I have that in my head from when I saw Blade Runner the first time. I was like, this is gonna be some kick ass sci fi. Mm-hmm. Not the case at all. No. And then I mean, it's really like detective noir, right? Yeah, very detective noir, atmospheric, um, slow burn. Yeah. Um, building up to something that's very personal. Okay. And then so and then I tried to watch Blade Runner again to see if I could connect the dots of 2049, not remembering anything of 2049, mm-hmm. and still not thinking of it being like a detective noir film. So <laughs> I'm like 0 for 3 yeah. <laughs> watching this thing on everything. Well, I think after seeing the Batman, it might help too. Because yeah. it sort of like sets that sort of same tone. That I like think detective noir style. It'd be a finer appreciation to it, yeah. Mm. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm I love noir films, so I'm not really opposed to it. You mm. know, um, it's just going to be easier for me to now have watched this and have a better understanding of maybe what I'm watching. Yeah, for sure. Um, so yeah, uh, if you guys uh, don't want to be spoiled for the next episode, uh, episode 19, be sure to watch Blade Runner. Blade Runner 2049, and The Northman, because we'll be talking about that one, too. Um, Jam-packed. Jam-packed. It's going to be a good one. Uh, So thank you guys for listening to this episode. Uh, You can find us on YouTube and Spotify. You look up the Neon Crew Podcast. We also have www.neoncrewpodcast.com. I need to update for that because I haven't in a bit because I've been really busy with moving and everything. Not trying to make an excuse, but I'm definitely trying to make an excuse. Um, so there you have that. Uh, and uh, you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Uh, we're on those socials. Uh, send Mac a, a DM on Twitter. 
he he may or may not reply <laughs> with a with a, a nice beautiful picture of himself. Yes. <laughs> The hearty yes. <laughs> there you have it, folks. Can't promise anything. Um so uh so Mac, do you have any any parting words? D- do I ever? Uh, 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 I can't do it. Uh, and with that, WWTHD. Bye everyone. <laughs> <laughs>